morning, everyone, and a very, very warm and special welcome to all of you, Good all Bali first year students that are joining in on this morning's orientation exercise. I'm Jarel Alda from the Division of Student Services and Development, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you on behalf of our division to our campus's first year experience program, otherwise known as FYE. So we are truly happy and honored that you have made the UE St. Augustine campus your choice. And of course, through the FYE program, we are committed to ensuring that you transition seamlessly to, our, to your first year of study and that you, of course, become fully integrated into our campus community and your new home at the UE St. Augustine. This morning is particularly important and exciting as the campus welcomes all of you to your new student orientation at the Faculty of Medical Sciences. If you are excited as we are to be joining the FMS, please let us know in the chat section that you are here and pumped and ready to be starting your first year because we are, of course, very, very happy to have you. It is my absolute pleasure to invite and introduce at this time Deputy Dean of Quality and the head of the Center for Medical Sciences Education, uh, at our university, Professor Sa, who will guide you through this morning's orientation program. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Mr. Jarel, for all your support and thank you to your team. And at the outset, I would like to extend on behalf of the faculty, on behalf of the, our colleagues here, a warm welcome to all our first year students. And with that note, now I would like to invite our deputy dean, Basic Health Sciences, Professor Chidam Ajenwaka to the podium, online virtual podium, to, to as a master of ceremony for this program. So, Prof. Ajenwaka, you are invited and over to you, Prof. Yeah, good morning, colleagues, and uh, very special welcome and good morning to our new students. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this faculty, the very special faculty in this university, in the sense that this faculty hosts uh, six uh, professional schools that I will introduce to you later on. Um, today, my duty is to introduce uh, the members of the faculty, the heads of these schools, and especially introduce the dean who will do the official address um, receiving you into this faculty. My name is Shidim Ezawanka. Primarily, I'm a professor of chemical pathology, but I serve as the deputy dean for basic health sciences. I usually like to give a pet talk to our students. It has been very difficult, very challenging for many of you to enter the school, either for medicine or dentistry or veterinary medicine, pharmacy, nursing or optometry. We have them here. And as you come in, you have to also be very ready to work hard, just like you did in your A-level or in your degree to be able to qualify to enter this faculty. And this faculty is faculty of healthcare professionals. And the, the teamwork that is expected in healthcare team, you will start experiencing it from day one. Students who are admitted to read dentistry, veterinary medicine or medicine, we share a number of courses in the first two and a half years. And those who are in nursing, we meet just like the people in pharmacy. We meet your colleagues during the clinical years in the world and in the clinic. So it is very fascinating that you will be interacting with all your colleagues in healthcare profession. And in that short note, I will always advise that you take your work seriously. All of you are more than 18 years old. What it means is that you are not dependent on your mother or your father or any guardian for you to carry on your activities here. As it is in this faculty, you will be expected at all times to check your emails in your secure area because that will be the means of communication to you. You check the notice board, you check the faculty website. We shall be communicating to you through those means. But when we come to face to face, you see that we have notice boards in the faculties and in schools through which we communicate to the students. It is unlike when you were in secondary school where the principals and the head teacher will be running around chasing you. Here, we don't chase the students and we don't have bell. 
but we have notice boards. We use email for formal communication in the sense that we are dealing with all adults. So I urge you seriously, and I'm sure that many of our speakers uh, for the whole five days will be emphasizing on the need for hard work, punctuality, all ethics, all professional ethics, you have to start exhibiting them from day one. It will be my interest to uh, introduce you to Dr. Oscar Osho, who is the director of School of Nursing. Those of you who were admitted or who are admitted now to read nothing, I think that's the you ahead and you'll be seeing him. I don't know if for sure is here to show you a video so that the students will recognize who is the director of School of Nursing. That's Dr. Joe smiling happily there. Thank you, and, and in due course, you will meet Dr. William Smith, who is the director of the School of Dentistry. Apparently, he is the head reporting to the dean. Is Dr. Smith here? Can you show your video for students to recognize you? You see Dr. William Smith there, and you see Dr. Rajiv uh, Dahia, who is the director of School of Pharmacy. Those of you admitted to read pharmacy, you see who is your director. And Dr. Kala Georges is the director of School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Georges, are you here? Can we see you in video? I'm not seeing his face there. And we have the coordinator of optometry. Those of you admitted to read optometry, uh, Dr. Neil Fanon is. Uh, the coordinator of that school, and practically that school is under the Department of uh, Clinical Surgical Sciences. And the School of Medicine has a director that is also the dean, Professor Terence Simongol, who is a physician. And I would like to introduce uh, just one or two other individuals that are important for most of you. Uh, here, there's a lady you would have met during your registration. You met visually or voice, Mrs. Vicklin Patterson Coombs. She is the senior administrative assistant in charge of the students. If you have done your registration, you would have done academic advising with her. I don't know if she is on video to show her face for the students who would have been interacting with her to see her. I don't think that she's here. Are you here, Vicklin? And then we have Dr. Farid Yusuf, who you will be, uh, I don't know how many of you that have contacted him, but we have this senior lecturer in physiology. He is the associate dean for students, so events or matters concerning you, if you contact um, uh, Dr. Yusuf, he'll be able to fast track it for you all the time. That is his responsibility, everything uh, concerning the students, except that he will not give you money, but he can facilitate other things. For students who are reading, who are admitted to study dentistry, veterinary medicine, and medicine. You will start with preclinical. And that is just like a school. And the first person you will meet there, the head of that department, for those three schools, you will meet Professor Christine Carrington. She is the head of preclinical sciences in medicine. And all the students that are admitted for medicine, veterinary medicine, dentistry you'll be doing the first course that that department uh, will be coordinating. After that, in one month thereafter, you meet Professor Geshwin Davis. I don't know if Dr. Davis is here. You will meet him. And there are many other resources we have in each department, in each unit. We have administrative assistants that will be helping you. And because we started uh, a bit late, I wouldn't take much of time. I encourage you to uh, go to our website. You see the names and email of all the administrative assistants that are attached to the directors and heads of department. You will be contacting them in case you have any issue to sort out. 
and now it is oh, my yeah. singular yeah. honor to yeah. introduce yeah. Yes. the dean of the faculty of medical sciences professor terence simongon who has been dean of this faculty is in the seventh year he's a physician by training but he is now the executive head of this faculty and he will address you and tell you all the things you need to know about our faculty what you have to do and what you wouldn't do dean simongol i hand over to you so i would like to thank you and uh, professor sir for this program um but i think that uh I must begin by saying how happy I am to welcome all of the students here. I'm seeing 490 participants, and I'm very, very happy to welcome you all to the start of a new part of your career. Also, I would like to uh, especially welcome our guest speakers and I saw Dr. Anthony Espine who is healing all the way from Australia and I know it's quite late at night there Tony thank you very much for taking the time to come to speak to us I'm really looking forward to your words of uh, with great interest um, and I know that our former chancellor is here uh, so George Allen, um, and he will also address the student body. So uh, I want to ask Professor Sa if you would give me a one minute notification or two minute notification just before the end of my talk, because uh, since we are running a little late, if you want to curtail my talk, that's also okay with, because I don't want to keep our guest speakers back. But uh, very quickly, um, I'd like to say to the students that some of you are in a four-year program, some of you are in a five-year program. For example, dentistry and medicine are both, and vet are all five years, uh, but optometry and nursing are two years. So it is quite a long time that you are going to be with us. And some of the ways that we do things you need to get used to now the first thing is that this is adult education so we take the students views into consideration and you or your representatives will be on several different committees which i urge you to attend that's the first thing there are student meetings i urge you to attend those as well second thing is we do not communicate with you in person because that is not feasible you receive notifications from marketing and communication, and you receive notices from various uh, offices in the university via your mailbox. You need to get used to looking in that mailbox. We will not email you in your personal emails. We will only email you in your UWI emails. Uh, so that's communication from a formal point of view from the university, as well as from your heads of department and various departmental lecturers. But apart from that formality, and I know that it is difficult because of the COVID pandemic, you need to take time to get to know each other and to learn from each other. And that is not possible in the way that we have been doing it before, which is face-to-face -face teaching, though we hope that that will begin perhaps in semester two. But for now, your communication would have to be online. And teaching online is what we have been doing for this year, uh, so far, this calendar year, and this is what we will continue for this academic year, for this first year. So that is always a little difficult because you can't judge the emotions or how people are feeling or how, 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 how receptive they are to what you are saying. Uh, so we ask you to interact. So ensure that you interact using the chat and where possible, speaking directly to whoever is giving you the lecture or the tutorial, tutorials being smaller groups where you interact with uh, your, your, your lecturer. Now, one of the key features 
of, and I'm going to use the word clinical practice in its broadest sense, because we all have clients here. In some cases, our clients, well, our clients are always humans, but in the case of the vet school, of course, they deal with humans who bring their pets in. In the broadest sense, the underlying feature of clinical practice, how we approach our patients is determined by the ethics of our profession. Ethics is not something that you can learn overnight. But in the first year of the program, we actually have a course on communication skills and ethics. As medicine unfolds, whether it be in veterinary medicine, dentistry, nursing, optometry or pharmacy, as it develops into what is going to be a very, very complicated future, future we feel that even now it's difficult to imagine, but feel impelled to go there, a mechanized future, an automated future, communication skills and ethics will become more and more important. And doctors may find themselves occupying the space between machines and humans. I'm not saying that that's how it will go, but that is one of the features that we see. How you say what you say, and what you say and when you say it, is going to be very important. But, important, but also importantly, you are not to assume a greater knowledge or a greater uh, capacity in practice than you are capable of doing or that you are, than you are certified to do. So general, generalists should not assume the role of a specialist. And maybe somebody who has specialized in a field for a very long time may not be able to adequately do what a generalist does. Now, in the School of Dentistry, we, we don't have any postgrad courses right now, but we will be developing those. But in the School of Medicine, there are a number of specialty courses. And in fact, you've come in here to learn to deal with patients. And you get a very limited exposure in year one, but that exposure is widened in year three and then it is very broad in years four and five. As a student, you are not a vet, you are not a doctor, and you will not be allowed to do what they do. And we want to make that quite clear. You don't want any students after they finish three years in veterinary medicine, going and deciding they could operate on animals. If that happens, you will be very strongly penalized. Now, you all might say that I'm not going to do that. But remember, that is what Peter said. It was only after he denied the Lord that you remembered, if you allow me to use that religious pun. And I'm looking at Peter here because he was or is a saint. So what I'm saying is, do not allow yourself to be seduced by the event around you. And that is very simply said, but it can be very, very difficult to do. Now, with regard to your program, Professor Inwaka, you let me know how much time I, I have. I have just two more points to make. Um, yes, so the final thing I want to tell you is that your programs are designed with, to bring or to leave you with increasing responsibility. So in the first year, you have very, very little responsibility. And some people are disappointed because they come in expecting to do this and that and so on. But the reason for that is that you have to learn how to communicate and how to do things ethically at the various stages of your career. So that when you leave, it becomes second nature. And the second thing is that there is a large 
theoretical basis to what you do. And at O levels and A levels, you learn the basic thinking skills. And now you need to learn to think in practice. And a key feature of that thinking in practice is something we call critical thinking, which I dare say we have practitioners here who are at the top of that. And I'm seeing uh, both Dr. Espinia and, and Mr. Ramnarayan, Ramnarayan being a surgeon. Um, and critical thinking is not something that comes naturally to everyone, but it is something that you can learn. You have to know, you'll be, you will have collected a large amount of facts from your clinical consultation. And as you think about those, it is which ones you wait, which ones you give importance to, and then how you use those to come to an understanding of what the problem is that is before you and how to resolve it. That is how I can explain critical thinking to you, but it is, it is a way of thinking, it is a way of, 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 of putting facts together. So the key issues here are, of course, you're onto a new stage of your life. We welcome you, we're terribly happy to have you and excited about taking you forward. There is an ethical basis upon which you will practice, which you need to take quite a bit of time to learn. And there is a thinking that you will learn, which we call critical thinking. So with that, I will wish you all the very best. And I will hand over to our moderator, Professor Kesilwaka. Thanks, bro. Uh, thank you, Dean for your address to our students, new students. And now I would like to again request our Dean, Professor Simangal, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Anthony Espenet, who will be delivering his lecture on professionalism and ethics. So, Prof. Uh, may I request you to present our next speaker? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Professor. Uh, Dr. Espinet, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our first year orientation exercise. And students, let me tell you a bit about Dr. Espinet. Um, graduated from the Faculty of Agriculture, and then went on to do medicine where he got his MBBS in 1988. After working here for a few years, he went to the UK where he became a fellow of the Royal College of Anesthetists. And having conquered the UK, you might say, he went on to Australia where he's a fellow of the college there and an outstanding practitioner in cardiovascular anesthesia. So he has moved from being a generalist to a specialist in anesthesia, as I was telling you all, and now a subspecialist in anesthesia. But that's not the most important thing about Dr. Espiné. When Dr. Espiné was in medical school, he was in the year above me. And I dare say, I learned a lot of medicine from Dr. Espinay, or Tony as we call him. I think I had the pleasure of him being my personal tutor. And I don't know why Tony gave me all of the advice that he gave me through medical school, but for each year, before the start of the year, I would go to him and ask him, what are the challenges and so on, and Tony would tell me. He was, and I dare say is, a great model of clinical practice. For Tony, the ethical basis of practice was always very, very important. And that was so from the time he was a medical student. As I thought far and wide outside of Trinidad and Tobago, I could think of no one better suited 
to give advice to new students. You come in here to become practitioners in all of the various fields. And it is really a superb practitioner who should give you bits of advice. And this is what, this is what Tony Espinier exemplifies. And the other point I wish to say is that Tony is a very devout practitioner of his religion as well. And we, and, and he took one day off every week to do that religiously. And it is something that all of us greatly admired about him. So he is not just a person who is very narrowly into a field, but he is somebody with a real understanding of the effects of medicine on the rest of the population. And that is another very important point in any professional practice, its relationship with the rest of society. So without further ado, I turn over to Dr. Espinay. Right, thank you very much, uh, Terence, Professor Simongal. Uh, what, so, such wonderful words, and I, and I feel humbled to be able to, um, to sit with you as it were. In, in your seat with you, um, Professor Simongal. Professor Simongal is my, my really good friend, and um, my wife and I speak often of him and his wife. The, um, they, they have been very good role models um, for us, um, and for me in particular as well. So, uh, Terry and Professor, I, I, I thank you for your words, and, and I really greet and welcome everybody. Uh, I, it's my alma mater, um, as Professor said, I, I came from from this medical school that you now belong to. And um, one of the things that becomes very evident is that uh, the Caribbean produces very high quality uh, graduates. Um, and, you know, we, we represent ourselves very well all over the world. As you know, Professor Simongal has been in the UK and pre presented outstanding, very outstanding contributions. And many of us have gone there as well. So, um, I just I, I celebrate this uh, time with you. I know it's, it's a difficult season because we go through all the COVID, uh, we're going through the COVID events and nobody's quite sure what's going on, but I think it, it behoves us, it becomes us to even rise higher because of this, um, you know, to, to give Ben an encouraging word, to let them know that uh, despite the, the difficulties of life, we can rise above it. And we can conquer it, and we can we can do our best. And um, the world is looking for for you to be the best. And that's really what this whole conversation is going to be about. You know, the question of ethics and professionalism. It's a, it's a large subject, and um, and uh, I don't want to overtake the time, so we'll try and condense it as much as I can. But it is something that you will be, le be learning for life. This is a life lesson, you know, and um, some people have wondered if you can teach something like ethics, you know, or is this ethics is something genetic, so it's linked to your family or your culture or how you grew up. Um, but there is no doubt that you, you can learn the principles of ethics and you can practice the principles of ethics and professionalism. So. What I want to do, if um, Terry, am I, am I, can I share my screen using my your system here? I'm hoping I can. I'm going to try. So, so that's that's what we're going to be covering. We're looking at um, medical ethics and professionalism. Um, so, as you see there, I'm, I'm, I'm an associate professor with two universities, and um, I, I operate as a pain specialist as well as an anesthetist. But my my, my primary role is in surgery. I operate as an interventional specialist, so I do a lot of work with the spine. Um, and when you're operating at that level, the whole question of being um, operating in that space, in a professional space, is so important. So we're going to spend the next hour, and I will pay attention to my time, 
to look at what this question of medical ethics is, what, what's the question of professionalism? How does it impact you as a young student of the, of the art form? Because this is, this is not just a science, this is an art form. It's, it's a professorship that you, you come to learn under the, 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 the guiding hands of the professors. It's, it's a school that you will, you will never, never graduate from. Now, in order to, to sort of introduce the, the subject, I just want to show you some ethical conundrums that you can sometimes have. So the first, the first one I want to present is, um, um, all right, let's see if this, let's try and get the screen to work. But yeah, there we go. So I, I just want to give you an, an ethical conundrum. You have uh, a doctor who goes to the emergency department and, and the, the, this clinical case is to ask you, what would you do? Because as you, as you operate in, in the field of medicine, you will come up with ethical issues and ethical questions that you need to find an answer to and they're not always easy. It is for this reason we will spend a lot of time looking at the principles and then and then hopefully by gathering the principles, you'll be able to apply it and maybe answer this question at the end. But here's a story. You have a, 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 a doctor in the emergency department and a 92-year-old man who has metastatic cancer of the lung uh, comes in. Now, that, 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 that gentleman, he's got, he's got a living will. So he's got a living will. And... Um, and, uh, and the living will, which he signed with in the presence of his sons and so on, says he will not be artificially ventilated. He doesn't want any heroic treatment. Um, but of course, you know, let's treat his pain and keep him well controlled. So it's so not quite appropriate. He says all of that. Now, the, the story is that um, uh, seven months later, his sons bring him into the emergency department. He's in severe pain but he's also in respiratory distress. Now, remember, he's, he's got a living will that says, don't do anything heroic uh, and don't be ventilated and so on. Um, so the team in the emergency department says, okay, look, we've got to do something to try and control his pain, but being aware of the fact that anything you give him might affect his, his, his respiration as well. So they, they, they give him a small dose of morphine, but instead of things getting better, things get worse. You know, his pain gets worse, he, his, his breathing becomes more labored, the, the patient and the relatives, everybody becomes more distressed, increasingly distressed. And then the patient and the, the children turn to you as a doctor and says, please do something. Now, you remember you have, he's got a living will uh, that says don't do anything heroic. So now, they, now him and the, him and the, um, and his, his, uh, his relatives, his children are saying, please do something. The question is, what should the emergency doctor do? See, those are the types of questions that will come to you. Well, what do you do next in the face of that information? It's an ethical conundrum. Um, here's another one that, that might, might be another conundrum for you um, as medical students as well. You have a 79-year-old woman who has Alzheimer's disease. She comes to the hospital. Um, sent by the general practitioner for evaluation of anemia. And um, when, you, when the blood is done, she's got a hemoglobin of 6.2. Uh, she goes off to the gastroenterology department. Um, and when they come back, they find she's got a large tumor, size of an egg, easily palpable in the anal, in the anal region. So very easy to feel it. It is clear that, that something that size, somebody didn't do their job. Somebody did not, you know, he, she's obviously passed through a number of doctors and nobody did a PR exam before. So anyway, the, 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 the doctor who is there is accompanied by a number of medical students like yourself, you know, and um, you know, the physician teacher who is now there seeing this person wants to teach the medical students how to examine a patient and she asks them, look, this is the type of patient you don't want to miss because you could make a big difference, you could save a life. Um, and he wants to show them how to palpate uh, that rectal tumor, you know, and says, if you can palpate that, you can feel it. it's big as an egg, you can't miss it, you could save a lot of lives. Of course, the problem is that the patient has Alzheimer's, she's unable to give consent to do the, um, the examination by the medical students. 
Nobody can, nobody's a wrong to give a consent. The big question is, what should the students be allowed to do? Is, you know, that's the question. You, know, you got the scenario. What, you know, she's there by herself. She's got Alzheimer's. What should the students be allowed to do? Such a wonderful learning opportunity that could save the lives of many. What should the students do? Now, that's a question we're trying to answer at the end. But uh, I think the basis of the basis of my uh, my little talk, the reason that I thought this subject is so important is is a quote that I I read from um, from Voltaire. Doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little, for diseases about which they understand even less, for people about whom they know nothing. And I think that really highlights the reason for us to have a very clear understanding to really grapple with this concept of medical ethics and the professionalism, because um, that is not uh, far from the truth. It is very true in many regards. And it is this random construct that we now have between the doctor and somebody whom we do not know really makes it an imperative for us and a duty for us that we talk about the type of relationship, this social contract that we are now forming between a doctor and a patient that we will refer to in terms of medical ethics, which is really what the conversation is about. Now, uh, a couple of comments over the 21st century. You know, there's, there's no doubt the 21st century has, has changed uh, dramatically. We, you know, we, we, we are living in an entirely new world. You know, we have advances in technology. Um, but unfortunately, what I can do is not always necessarily what I should do despite the technology, you know, that, that's a medical uh, ethical question. You know, we're operating in, in an area with, with their healthcare economics, you know, and um, there was a time when whatever you wanted to do, you could do as a doctor. But now if you want to give something to everyone, you can't give everything. And if you want to give everything, then you can't give it to everyone because it's all related to to, to um, money issues, the financial purse that the government is operating with. You just can't give everything to everyone. So we have, we have some health economic issues that will influence how we approach dealing with people. Then we have the issue of public uh, awareness of healthcare issues. So the patient that is coming to us now is armed with information that he gets from the internet. Um, uh, they're not coming to us with zero information. They're coming to us uh, with an opinion. And quite often that, that, that opinion is distorted. Um, it's not correct at all. So we have people coming in here that, that you know, is going to impact on, on, on how we approach, how we relate to people. Um, then we also have in the 21st century, a lot of the patient advocate groups and, and of course the media itself, you know, uh, and quite often, these groups are very sensational. The media can be very sensational. And uh, they can really distort the real picture of what you're dealing with. I mean, look, look at what's happening with the COVID crisis and the involvement of the media and how much that has been played and counterplayed and interplayed um, to give a view that may not necessarily be always correct. Then on top of that, we, there are negative elements in our society, some of which, I'll be honest with you, are doctors. So my doctors, um, and and uh, as a result of that, in, in all the ministries and so on, ministries of health, um, you get ombudsmen, and these ombudsmen are there to deal with the complaints. And of course, when a complaint comes about a doctor, that that complaint is spread throughout the whole society. Everything goes in the front page of this doctor did this and this doctor did that and so on. So th th there are negative elements going on, um, and the media does carry it. And, um, and, and as a result of that, because we are dealing with people whose operational modus operandi is greed and, and arrogance and deception and coercion, all of this is going to impact on how we, how we actually relate um, to the patient in the, in the real world that, that all of us have to do. Uh, but perhaps uh, of all those elements, the most important thing is the fact that, um, that there's this transition or change over or transfer 
of the decision making process from from the from the from the original doctor the doctor was like god in the past he did everything nobody asked any questions the patient would come in sit quietly and let let the doctor do whatever he wants there is this transfer of the decision making process to the patient and now the patient has become a partner uh, and correctly so in the in his uh, medical care but i'm saying those that is medicine in the 21st century it has changed differently to what it was 10 20 30 years ago and we have to grapple with this new um, construct of, of 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 things that we have to deal with um, in our society and they're very real and of course the question is uh, we need to we need to operate with some professionalism because doctors are professionals we are professionals um, and and we need to operate in that moral context um, with integrity and honesty and mutual respect and empathy and trust and, and mutual goals and so on. So the question is, what's professionalism? Well, the, the basic elements of professionalism, uh, in regard to medicine anyway, um, uh, is, is, uh, there were f- f- four or five of them I want to share with you. One of them is altruism. Altruism is looking after the best interest of the patient, not yourself. We're talking about medical professionalism here. You know, these are the elements of profession of what it means to be a professional operating as a doctor. Um, then there is the, there's a question of accountability. Um, accountability means that we we have to we owe some report, some some measure of stewardship to the patient, to the society, and to the profession itself. We have we are going to be held accountable. By, by the by the patient, the society, this contract that we have established with the society and our own profession, we are we are accountable to them. Um, as a professional, doctors are professionals, we have to strive for excellence. We have to exceed the ordinary, you see? Um, because it, to, to be honest, in medicine, um, in order to stand still, you have to run very, very fast. You know, medicine is moving at such a pace. Um, the only way you could even begin to stand still is to move fast ahead. You, you've got to keep up. You've got to, you've got to operate in, in a realm of excellence. Um, there is no room for mediocrity in the medical, in the medical environment because, because life and things are moving much too quickly. And, and you, you have to bear in mind that we're not dealing with cars and immaterial things. We're dealing with humans, people whose lives are being uh, put in our hands, trusted to us. And it's really important, therefore, we always strive for excellence. Then, of course, there's the whole question of duty. To be a professional, you have to be um, you have to be committed to the service for which you have been given. It's not a this really is not a job. It's a calling. Now, I, I know that might sound a bit old fashioned for a lot of people, but you know, the longer you stay in this in the in the profession, you realize this is not a job. It's a calling. It, it, it's a commitment to service and it will require of us and will require of you um, a, 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 a sacrifice that many of us um, may not have appreciated when we started it. It will call on you to make very large sacrifices because the, 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 this is a high calling. It's, it's a wonderful commitment um, that people are, you are allowed to, to minister and to help people in the ways that we are allowed to do so. So it's a duty, a commitment to service. Professionalism, medical professionalism involves honor integrity, honor and integrity, which is maintaining the highest standards of behavior, being fair and truthful, and keeping your promises. You see, if you, you know, that's 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 what it's talking about. Integrity means you mean what you say, you say what you mean, you keep your promises, you operate in the highest standard of behavior and probity. Uh, being fair and truthful. And of course, the, the whole element of respect is an important part of our professionalism, respect for, for people, for their humanity. You know, when you say a person is not a number, it's not a number, it's not even a patient. Um, you, you should never treat a person as a patient. They are patients, I know that, I, I, I know the terminology. That's not a patient, that's a person. That's a person who's got uh, a family and children and, 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 and jobs and, and cars and houses and, and lives. That's a person. Treat them as a person. They're not just a number. 
you know, a UR number on your on your on your medical sheet. That's that's not what you're dealing with. This, these are real people who have um, who have um, real issue, real challenges, real people that we have to deal with. Treat them with respect. They respect their their due, respect for their humanity. Um, you know, collegiality with your with your colleagues and and dignity. Treating people with dignity and respect. You know, you know, you, we don't want people to disrespect us. Don't disrespect anyone. You cannot disrespect a person because you think you're a doctor. You treat people with respect because you expect respect. And, uh, and that's, that's part of being a professional. A professional doesn't disrespect a patient and load it over them and shout at them and make them believe that they're stupid. That's not being professional. That's not treating people with respect. So, so those are the sort of elements of, of professionalism. Now, uh, let, let me just kind of deal with the, the medical ethic, ethics question. So, so because we're going to come back to the professionalism in a little while. In order to address this question of medical ethics, we, we want to look at a few things. We're going to look at some definitions. I want to go to the historical background of it. We want to look at some of the principles, the four basic principles of medical ethics, um, the contemporary issues that we have to deal with in medical ethics, some of which are already alluded to. Um, it's important that you see some legal framework, some landmark judgments that, that have impacted on the question of medical ethics and how we interpret medical ethics, some ethical dilemmas. And what when at, at the end of all of this, um, I want to summarize what I think based on all the information we have, would what, be the, what would be the attributes of an ethical doctor? You know, what would an ethical doctor look like based on all the information, all the facts, all the, all the data that I'm giving you? So that's, that's what we're going to try and do in, 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 in the time allocated to us. Well, let's, let's first of all look at, the, let's look at the definition. Let's look at the definition. What, when we talk about ethics or medical ethics, but we talk about ethics, ethics is a branch of philosophy and it deals with moral questions, moral issues. The word actually comes from the Greek word ethos. If you look at the Oxford, Def, Oxford Def, Dictionary's definition of ethics, it's a moral principle that governs a person's behavior and the conduct of the activity. We're dealing with moral questions, questions of right and wrong. And it governs our behavior, how we operate, how we function. You look at the, the Merriam-Webster dictionary uh, definition of ethics. It's a discipline dealing with what is good and bad and with the moral duty we have, an obligation. That's, that's what we're talking about ethics. You know, let's get right down to what, what it means. We're discussing with more, we're dealing with moral questions. It's a philosophical, philosophy is what drives your behavior. Everything that you, everything we do is driven by a philosophy that we function or operate with. There is some philosophy, some guiding principle that controls our behavior. And so when we're dealing with ethics and particularly med medical ethics, we're talking about the, the, the principles that govern our behavior. Why, do you, why did you do what you just did? Why did you, why did you behave the way you did? Well, there's a philosophy behind it. And ethics is trying to govern that philosophy and to, and to, and to, and to inform that philosophy so that, so that your, your behavior is, is consistent with what we would consider good medical, medical ethics. So, so, so that's what it was. It, it, it's there now. Ethics is not um, ethics is not a new um, field. Ethics is new, not a new field at all. It, it, it has got very strong uh, historical um, uh, background. Medical ethics, I'm speaking of now. So you, you looked at the Hippocratic oath that that goes way back to the fifth century BC. Um, you have the formula Comitis um, Acetorum, which dates back to the fifth century AD. Uh, then you have Thomas Percival's uh, Code of Medical Ethics in the early 19th century, which is the first one who codified it. I'll talk a little bit about it just now. Then you have the Nuremberg Code, which, code, which was drafted after the Second World War in 1947. Then you have the Declaration of Geneva in 1948, and then the Declaration of Helsinki in 1964. Now, these are all, these are all um, uh, documents that we really need to have some understanding of albeit not in too much depth, but we need to know a little bit about them because that's where our ethics come from. Uh, much of our principles that we operate from didn't just jump out, drop out of the sky. 
these have been emerging and developing over many years, and and it's really important to, to see and understand what the what the uh, what the back, where our history comes from. A man who does not understand his his history is destined to to repeat the mistakes. You ought to see where our history comes from. So the Hippocratic oath, many of us are familiar with that. Um, Hipp 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 Hippocrates is is widely regarded as the father of medicine. And um, his oath, the oath of Hippocrates was taken by all newly qualified doctors in his day. Uh, these doctors would pass um, by several Greek gods and goddesses and they would swear the oath. But the, the important thing is that there are two promises that were made in the oath um, when, they, when they, they said the Hippocratic oath, which I want to point out. One is that there was a promise to be reverential to the doctor's teacher. In other words, pay respect to the teacher who taught you. Um, it, it was it was very much a, a professorial system. Be respectful to your teacher. And the other part was, which again you will see, as as I said, this is why you look at the history of it. You realize a lot of what we see actually has its roots in in what has existed before. So the 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 second uh, promise that you had to make under the Hippocratic oath is the promise not to cause any harm to patient. First, do no harm is where that story comes from. And many, many, many colleges still follow the Hippocratic Oath. But um, th so that's, 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 that's the Hippocratic Oath, the, sort of maybe the, the foundation of, of what we now call medical ethics. And you had the, the, the formula comitis archaeotorum. And, and, and this was the earliest known code of medical ethics that contained, uh, was contained within the works of um, Cassiodorus, who is the Roman statesman. He served under King uh, Theodoric. But um, but the thing about about the, the recommendations of, of this group um, was that um, some of the recommendations included that physicians should widen and deepen their knowledge. You see, that was some of the recommendations coming out of this this group way back in um, in in the fifth fifth century AD. And then physicians should call, consult with other physicians. Now you, you you see these are great principles that we still follow, but it's root is way back into these old ones. This is way back in the fifth century um, AD after the, the uh, birth of Christ. So then you have the Thomas, Thomas Percival's Code of Medical Ethics. And, um, and he emphasized the independence and authority of physicians and their responsibility to care for the sick. You see, that was, that was his contribution. Uh, he is credited to, to, to being the uh, first modern code of medical ethics. Uh, he, he emphasized this independence and physicians and care for the sick. And some of the highlights of this code included that physicians should be a minister of hope and comfort to the sick. I say amen to that. So it's, it's a good word. It's a good word. We should be, we should be, pe people are seeking hope and comfort. And we ought to be that source of comfort to them and a source of hope that there is help for you. May not have all the answers, but I'll try. And if I don't, I can find somebody who will help you. Um, the other element of this code, of the Thomas Percival's code, is uh, it may be, he says it may be justifiable to violate the truth for the benefit of the patient. Theoret his third one is theoretical discussion should generally be avoided. In other words, you know, don't get into a whole lot of talk uh, and, uh, and, and discussing great philosophy. And he says the code, of course, also covered other things. It covered regular academic education, the need to upgrade your skills, um, how you should operate in retirement. In other words, you have at some point you need to know to put down the put down the shovel. You know, you got you at some point you have to to to, to bow out of the of it because your competence uh, is lost. So all of these things were um, were discussed by 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 the Thomas Percival Code of Medical Ethics. Now we go to the Nuremberg Code. Now again, this is a uh, this was drafted after the war crimes of the Second World War. Um, it was part of the uh, what later became the overall um, doctor's trial, which was held by the American military. And they tried a number of Nazi doctor, doctors, officials, who were involved in unethical medical practice. And, um, and anyway, so the, seven of those uh, were included, including Karl Brandt, who was Hitler's personal physician. Um, was sentenced to death. He had about nine who were given various prison sentences and about seven who um, they were acquitted. But anyway, the, the, the Nuremberg Code uh, dealt with um, the issues of medical research because as we know, um, during the Hitler years, they were doing research on, 
you know, medical research doctors were doing unethical medical research on people. So there were a number of points anyway dealing with uh, medical research and um, and uh, things like a informed consent, avoiding unnecessary risk and uh, freedom of participants to leave these studies. Now, those elements of the Nuremberg Code still apply. I, um, I do a lot of research at university and, and these, these codes are still relevant. Now, the reason that I'm also mentioning the Nuremberg Code, besides the fact that it forms part of, of the informed consent process, is uh, to show you that there's a certain hypocrisy that still existed. Um, the, the, in the Nuremberg Code, the American... Uh, the American panelists and doctors were the one that um, sentenced the so-called doctor's trial in the tribunals. But there is this thing called the Tuskegee, Tuskegee syphilis experiment. So um, in the Tuskegee um, syphilis experiments, which went on from between 1932 to 1972, um, the, 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 um, the American government, um, they, they studied um, hundreds of poor black rural men in, in the state of Alabama they gave them syphilis and they, they left it untreated because they wanted to see what would be the consequence of long-term syphilis. Even though there was penicillin, penicillin was widely being used there since the 1940s, but, um, but these men um, were, were human experiments, these black, um, uh, these black, uh, black men from, from Alabama. And, um, and so it was allowed for, for all these years to, um, to see what would happen with, with long-term syphilis. Now, um, eventually when this thing, um, the Congress, of course, found out of congressional hearings, found out about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, of course it was, it was a big issue, but out of that came forth a number of, of, of reforms um, in the US medical research, setting up to what we call IRBs now, institutional review boards. Now, when you do research, you have to pass all your research to an IRB, an institutional review board. But that's where it came from as a result of the Tuskegee experiments and, um, and the American um, Congress realizing what was being done um, unethically, um, experimenting with, with people. Um, and Bill Clinton himself formally apologized for the study in, um, in, in 1997 for these uh, black people that were, were given, deliberately given syphilis and not treated. Um, and so out of that now, we, we've got very clear ideas of reform on, on ethics, how we are ethically supposed to be treating people. Then you have the Declaration of Geneva, and um, it's also called the Physician's Oath. Um, and this, is, this Declaration of Geneva is, is the, modern, the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath, um, adopted by the General Assembly of the World Medical Association in 1948, um, amended several times. But some of the promises of the oath were that the health of my patient will be my first consideration. This is the Declaration of Geneva. Uh, number two, my colleagues will be my brothers and sisters, meaning our medical colleagues. Uh, number three, I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat. You see, these are good principles that have, uh, that have emerged. Um, you know, our medical ethical, our medical ethics didn't just just come from nowhere. They emerge historically from, from, from situations and circumstances that people had to respond to. So that was the Declaration of Geneva in 1948. Then you had the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, the Declaration of Helsinki was the first adopted in 1964 by the World Medical Association, meeting in Helsinki, and revised several times, the last time being in 2013. But what does it deal with? It deals with with ethics relating to medical research in humans. So if you're doing human studies, you know, if you're doing any studies in humans, um, you have to, you have to, to you have to find approval from the um, Declaration of Helsinki. Um, so the Declaration of Helsinki, anyway, covers a number of areas, including research ethic com uh, committees, privacy and confidentiality, vulnerable groups and individuals, so we get consent from them, informed consent issues. Um, and the use of placebos. So much of what we now refer to in ethics has come as a result of those the, the history of those um, of those declarations over the over the last few years. So now that we've gathered a bit of history and we've looked at some principles of, of um, uh, principles of uh, behind or, or getting behind ethics, what would be the pillars of medical ethics? 
how can we formulate in our minds the pillars, the foundation pillars of medical ethics? Well, uh, there are four, four pillars. One is autonomy. The other one is non-maleficence. The third pillar is beneficence. And the fourth pillar is justice. So those are the four pillars of medical ethics. I just want to take a little time to go through each one of them really quickly because that's how we're going to emerge with what would be the, um, the ethical doctor. All of, everything I'm saying is going, to, is going to merge into what we eventually call what is the, what does an ethical doctor look like? So um, in autonomy, the auto autonomy refers to the, the right of a competent adult patient to take decisions regarding his or own, or own health care. In other words, uh, when you're dealing with autonomy, a patient has a right to refuse treatment. A patient has a right to refuse to take part in research. Um, and the healthcare provider um, can only provide, should only provide relevant information, but should not try to influence or coerce a person into doing research or, or taking a specific treatment, even if you think it is the right thing to do for them. And that's the principle of autonomy. A competent adult patient has the right to make decisions concerning his or own health care. That's autonomy. And this is what forms the basis of informed consent. It's the whole, it's, it is on the principle that people have a right to do with their bodies what they want to do. Then you have, um, then you have um, the, the quest principles of non-maleficent. Uh, that, that, is, that is based on the principle of first do no harm. First do no harm. So, so in this principle, the second pillar of, of medical ethics, the healthcare pr practitioner should avoid causing harm either by acts of commission, which means providing a wrong or unnecessary treatment. So that's the act of commission. You give them the wrong treatment or by the acts of omission. That is, you didn't provide the right or necessary treatment. Um, and so, 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 so that's, in, that's the principle of non-maleficence. You, you, you don't give them the wrong treatment or you don't withhold the right treatment from them. Um, the, the, this principle, if you violate the principle of non-maleficence, that is what leads to the complaint of medical malpractice and medical negligence. So we say autonomy is the basis of informed consent. Non-maleficence is the basis of medical malpractice and medical negligence, because you did something that you should not do, or you didn't do something that you should have done. That's the whole question of first do no harm. Don't, don't, don't do any harm to the person. The third print, the third pillar is beneficent. And that's the corollary of non-maleficence. In other words, this principle states that the goal of treatment should be to provide the best treatment and the best help to the patient in front of you. That's, that's what beneficent. So, so, so non-maleficent, don't do any harm. Beneficence, do good to the person. Do the best possible treatment, the best possible option, the best possible uh, alternatives for that person. That's beneficence. And uh, when treatment, uh, when the treatment in the context of beneficent, when the treatment has both uh, benefit and harm, then it is the duty of the doctor to weigh up the, the benefits versus the, the adverse events and, and work it out so that the benefit of the treatment outweighs the harm of the treatment. If there is a case for that, that's what you have to do. Does the benefit outweigh the harm? That's the whole principles of beneficence. And finally, justice. A justice um, is, is, is the principle of uh, that, that all men should be treated fairly. Uh, that's what justice is about. That's the fourth pillar of medical ethics. All men should be treated fairly. There should be no discrimination based on gender or age or religion or wealth or sexuality. It's the whole concept of equality. Um, and that clinical need should determine the allocation of resources. So the, 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 the person who has a more severe illness justifiably should we get more health resources than a person who is not uh, severely ill. That, that's the concept of, of equity. You know, if you are very sick, then more resources should go to you. And if you're not sick, you don't need the resources because you're not, you're not sick. That's the concept of equity or fairness. Um, it's a lofty principle. It's a lofty principle. Unfortunately, 
um, in, in real life, it's very hard to practice because um, unless you have a nationalized health system where everybody gets treated, whether you're rich or poor, then you can't achieve that necessary, necessary that level of equity. Because in most hospitals, certainly where I, li- where I live in Australia, um, there's an inherent, inherent um, unfairness or injustice because your treatment is provided to those who can afford it. So if you can afford the, uh, your, your medical insurance or if you can afford to pay for it, you get your treatment. Um, there are public hospitals, but you'll have to wait, you know, many years to get that treatment. So just the principle of justice is, is a pillar of medical ethics, but it, it's a lofty idea. But we find in the real world, these um, sometimes these pillars are, these pillars are lacking. Um, it's missing because of, the, because of the unfairness that is inherently built in the economy system, economic systems of our world. So, so th- those are the principles of ethics. Now, uh, with that in mind, I've been covered a lot of information. Um, I just want to go through what will be some of the contemporary issues. So within principles, what we did just now is principles. Can I teach you to be ethical? You know, is it possible to give you the, the, the principles that would guide you into becoming an ethical person? I happen to believe that is true. You can. It's knowledge-based and behavior-based. But so all of those were big principles, and, and we're still going on. I, I want to, sh- to kind of share with you, if you will permit me, um, some contemporary issues on medical ethics that, that you have to grapple with. So we looked at big principles, went back to the history and, and the codes and how we all emerged to where we are. Here are some contemporary issues that, uh, of medical ethics that you, you, you and I have to grapple with right now. Uh, issues of confidentiality, um, mental capacity, informed consent, um, the core concept of advanced direction, advanced decisions, uh, the question of patient dignity and safety, uh, medical malpractice, very real, uh, and the whole question of being a professional in, in this kind of environment as well. So I want to go through those really quickly now, um, because these are the contemporary issues that we have to deal with. Let, let me go through these very quickly with you. So confidentiality. So the big thing is that as a doctor, we have a duty to ensure that information that we that the patient shares with us is kept confidential. It's an absolute law. It's an absolute law. Um, it, it cannot be disclosed. It should not be disclosed to other, others. Um, in general, patients have a right to confidentiality. That's their right. That's their right. And it is important that um, it, it's important that your or confi- the confidentiality of patients is maintained because if you want the patient to continue to have trust in you then you should you need to maintain their confidentiality so that's this is an ethical question here the question of confident confidentiality now a, a competent person's consent therefore must be obtained before you share information even with their relatives or their friends now that's a strong one but that's a fact you cannot share information to a, a relative, a mother, a father, a daughter, a brother, sister, no one, in a comp- dealing with a competent person, mentally competent, you cannot share any information about them unless you get the consent of that person. You cannot share it. You, you cannot share um, that information with employers. You can't even share it with other doctors who are not involved in the case. You can't just say, well, I'm sending the information to America because I want to get some advice about what this person is and give all the details of the person. You have got to get consent to share information that is theirs because that's the principle of confidentiality. And particularly now, um, we have to be very careful because um, we can't be putting out information in the public domain with the platforms that we now have. You know, we have in all, all this sort of internet and Facebook and Bookface and Top face and TikTok and talk tick and all, all, all kind of fancy things, blogs and chat rooms and all that sort of thing. And, and it is important that no nothing can should be discussed about a patient in any of those platforms because those platforms are you know they go to all the world. Even if you're looking at medical journaling, you want to do a publish a paper, you want to send in a report, you have to hide 
um, the the information of the person so that so that the the information is not is not revealed. And even with that, you need their consent. So. So it's important to know that confidence, confidentiality is important. Now, there, there are occasions, there are occasions where confidentiality, confidentiality can be breached. So we just said confidentiality is a law of, 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 your, of your practice, of medical ethics. It's a law of your practice. But there are some cases where confidentiality can be breached. Now, if there's ongoing uh, potential legal com, um, com considerations or implications, if there are legal implications, then by then confidentiality can be breached. For example, if the, the local law warrants disclosure on those matters, then you are required, like pe people who are pedophiles, if you have that information, you have to reveal it. There's no confidential question there that the local law requires it. Um, you have like when a, when a patient is, you're suspecting a patient of being a victim of, of, of something horrible or crime or a perpetrator of a crime, you know, or a patient who has a notifiable infectious disease, he's got HIV, he's got some notifiable disease, then, then you can breach the person's confidentiality under those conditions. Um, here's another reason. When a patient discloses information that, um, that they're going to commit a crime or they, are, they have either committed a crime or they're, going to, or they're planning to commit a crime, um, then you are required to 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 um, to breach that confidentiality about them. So, and number four, here's another one where which is required. Um, if a person is unfit to drive, for example, they have uncontrolled epilepsy or they have some acute psychosis or advanced dementia, and the the patient continues to drive, then you are required to 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 for the safety of others, you are required to breach that confidentiality and pass that information on to the police or, or to relevant authorities. So, so confidentiality plays a very important part, but um, there are some situations where you, you, you are required and you can breach that confidentiality for the safety of that person or for the safety of, the, of others or because the law requires it. Now, the, the other thing that, that, that may, it'll be really important to say is that, is that um, confidenti con confidentiality continues to apply confidentiality laws continue to apply even when the patient is dead. Uh, I say that again. Confidentiality laws apply even when the patient is the person is dead. So because they're dead doesn't give us authority, doesn't give us the freedom to go take all the information and scatter it all over the internet. Um, that law applies even when they're dead. And, uh, and therefore, you know, we need, to, we need to be respectful of that. Um, when it comes to a person's notes, I just want to make a point there. A person has a right to request his or her medical notes. It has, to, it has to go through the local guidelines, business apply in the correct way and so on. Um, but they are, they, they are entitled to their notes um, according by law. Um, there are some information you not, not doesn't necessarily have to always give every piece of information, but a person is entitled to their notes because it's their body. All right, so that's, so that's the principle, principle of confidentiality. Let's move on quickly, mental health. Mental health. That refers to the capability of a person to understand information and make decisions. So a person is deemed to, um, to have um, adequate mental or possess mental capacity, number one, if, if she can understand the information uh, that is relevant to the decision in question. We're talking about what, what constitutes somebody who has adequate mental capacity. Uh, number two, if they can retain that information. Number three, if they can weigh that information up, including looking at the pros and cons and arrive at a decision. And number four, if they can communicate that information to you, either orally or by gesture or by writing or blinking. So at that point, they are considered mentally capable. And that's part of a, a contemporary issue for us dealing with people who get into accidents and have locked in syndromes and so on. So mental capacity is an important one. Um, when a person is, is, is mentally capable, now this is where this is so vital to the whole question of, of, of yeah. medical ethics because we're dealing with right and wrong. Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Espine. So yes. we're running a little bit late. And so- All right. Yeah. Let, me, let me go straight to the conclusion then. Yeah. I'll go one to the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, I'm going to therefore, based on a lot of the information, uh, 
um, which we don't have time to. I apologize that uh, we have too much more than we can cover. I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to give me one minute. I'm just going to go out and show you one slide or two slides and we finish. And I thank you for your time and for your patience. So this is the slide I just want to show everybody. Two slides. What will be the attributes of an ethical doctor? We would have had a lot of time to deal with it. Number one, has the welfare of the patients as their primary goal. Number two, displays honesty and integrity in all dealings with the patients fairly and, and, and with other professionals. Number three, treats patients with dignity. Number four, respects the confidentiality of patients. Number five, gets informed consent before treating patients. Number six, does not exploit vulnerable patients. Number seven, participates only in research that is ethical and approved. Number eight, maintains and develops professional knowledge. Number nine, shares professional knowledge for the benefit of others, which might include their doctors, medical students, and so on. Number 10, respects the religious, spiritual, cultural, political, and the beliefs of patients, does not try to influence these beliefs. Number 11, does not misuse professional knowledge and expertise to cause harm. Number 12, maintains clear therapeutic boundaries and respect between doctor and patients. Number 13, knows when to seek outside opinions when the issue or question is clearly beyond their control and expertise. And number 14, is willing to challenge unethical contact of, con uh, of colleagues, uh, that's unethical behavior of colleagues. So, so that's it in conclusion. I'm not going to do any of this. I'm just going to pass it on. I thank you very much for your time because I do know you have other things going. And, uh, and thank you so much for allowing me to share with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Espinet and uh, for your very much informative lecture to our students and colleagues over here. And now we would like to invite a uh, few questions from our audience. If they have any questions, they can come forward and for next two, three minutes so that Dr. Espene could respond to those questions. So any questions and comments are welcome from the audience. It's a big subject, <laughs> as you know. Uh, as you know, this it takes it takes um, it, it takes much more time. But that's that's what uh, as Professor Simungal was saying. For the rest of your four or five years, and then for the rest of your life, you will be dealing with these issues, and these issues are changing rapidly, rapidly. And um, what what you want to do is establish the principles because the circumstances are changing, but the principles should be the same. Um, I think the, the idea is you, you, you keep within that, uh, that moral code of trying to do the best you can for these patients and for, for your colleagues and to improve yourself. And I think, you know, your, your, your question of ethics and professionalism will go a long way. Okay. Thank you. And if you don't have any questions or comments, so I would like to express my special thanks on behalf of the Dean on behalf of the university and the faculty of medical sciences to reaching for reaching to our students at this point of time mm -hmm. from east to the west and yes. and, and i wish you so i wish, you, all, I wish yeah. you professor and, and your students all the best as i said it's my alma mater and i'm always i'm always glad to see that our, our students are doing well thank you thank you and we'll be looking forward for more collaboration on this aspect in future Thank you very much. And with that, now I would like to invite again our Dean, Professor Simangal, to introduce our next speaker, esteemed speaker, Sir George Allen. So, Dean, over to you. Hi, everyone. And again, it is a distinct pleasure now for me to introduce a great mentor, not of myself this time, but of the university as a whole. Uh, Professor Sir George Allen Moore O'Garin Allen is now Chancellor Emeritus. A unique distinction. I'm not aware that we've ever had a Chancellor Emeritus of the University of the West Indies. Sir George was born on, in, in 1932 at Lucas Street, St. Philip Barbados. He received his early education and at Holy Trinity Boys School, and then moved to the famous Harrison College. He received the Barbadian Scholarship in 1951, and you will recall our university started in 1947 with the medical school in Mona. 
And that scholarship allowed him to go anywhere in the world, and most people would have gone to England, but he decided to study at the University College of the West Indies at Mona, Jamaica, despite having the opportunity, as I said, to go elsewhere. After graduation in medicine from the UWI as the gold medalist with the degree of MBBS in 1957, he obtained his MD, which is a further graduate degree from the University of London in 1965. He entered academic medicine at UWI in 1962, and his career included research at the Tropical Metabolism and Research Unit for his doctorate, PhD in medicine. He was appointed professor of medicine at UWI in 1972, and four years later, uh, became chairman of the Department of Medicine. And I dare say, and, 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 and so George, this, is, this will be the culture now that's passed on to me, but if I recall correctly, uh, from what I was told, uh, you were the major mover to developing the DM in medicine, the doctorate in medicine, which is our highest degree of professional practice that we offer. He is an emeritus professor of UWI and was appointed chancellor in 2003, from which he demitted office only a few years ago. So George, has a large number of scientific publications, well over 100. And during his term as director of PAHO and subsequently, he has given numerous speeches and presentations in which he has dealt with issues such as equity in health, health de and development, HIV AIDS, and the basis for international cooperation in health. He has also addressed several aspects of Caribbean health and the problems that the region faces and the interface between health and these problems. So George has received numerous awards in recognition of his work, including prestigious decorations and national honors from many countries of the Americas. In 1990, he was made Knight Bachelor by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for his services in medicine. In 2001, he was awarded the Order of the Caribbean Community, the highest honor that can be conferred on a Caribbean national. I could think of no one better suited to give the talk of the relationship of medicine to the society. In other words, something that we have now come to call social accountability. But I was thrilled when Sir George agreed to do it, because I know that a lot of demands are still made of his time. Sir George, it is with great pleasure and humility that I welcome you to the podium, as it were, to give some advice to our Faculty of Medical Sciences new students. Thank you, Sir George. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. I trust you can hear me. Thank you very yes, much. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. And let me thank you for that very warm uh, welcome. And let me congratulate the organizers for putting together something like this. I know it cannot be easy to organize something uh, that accommodates 400 odd students and numerous faculty from, and speakers from various parts of the world. When the Dean asked me to speak and he suggested a topic, I hesitated. And I thought to myself, now I entered medicine exactly 70 years ago. Uh, and I thought to myself, what have I learned over 70 years that would be useful to 18 year olds today? What have I learned? And I thought that in the minutes allotted to me, I would try to distill some of the experiences and the mistakes I have made over the last 70 years in something that might be useful to you. The second reason I accepted was that I always loved students. When I left the university, the thing I missed most, I had a, a separation uh, anxiety because I missed the students. And I, I miss students terribly. And my regret is that we cannot meet together in person so that you can tell me when I'm wrong. And the third thing, of course, is the relevance of the issues, as Dr. Espinay pointed out so brilliantly. 
And the final thing, which is, which is definitely not the most important, I accept it because of the high regard I have for your dean, Dr. Terrence Simongo, and what he has done in St. In Saint Augustine. Uh, I have a tremendous regard for your dean and what he's done in, 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 in St. Augustine. Now, let me try to share my screen and let me see if it really works this time. There we are, there we are, there we are, there we are. There we are. Yes, the, the, the topic is what it means to be a healthcare professional and uh, also the corollary, social accountability in healthcare professions. And again, I thought of myself as an 18 year old, what would be useful for me to know? What things should I think about? Uh, at that stage, you don't even know what a stethoscope is. You don't know what a bistury is, but there are still some things about being a healthcare professional that I think is useful to introduce to 17, to eight, 17 and 18 year olds. So those are two topics. What it means to be a healthcare professional and what does the issue of social accountability really mean in the healthcare, in the healthcare professions? Let, let, let me start with being what is a professional. I know that Dr. Espinel has gone into this. Profession, I'm not going to give the original Latin, but it comes from the uh, uh, word to profess, to vow, to commit. A profession, the profession is a group of people who have, uh, have uh, vowed, who have promised to commit to doing something. And professional really represents a commitment, vows of service, as Dr. Espinel says, integrity and high standards. And let me, in ancient times, there were only three professions, divinity, law, and medicine. But let me make the point, a professional is not necessarily confined to medicine, of course. There are professionals in many walks of life. In many disciplines, there are professionals. And some of the tenets of professional, many or most of the tenets of professional are discipline ignorant. They do not depend on the particular discipline you practice. That's one of the things I think you need to get about. This professional practice, not only in divinity law, medicine, but there's in architecture, there's in plumbing, there's in many other areas that there is professionalism. And what does it mean now to be a profession? According to looking at Wikipedia, one of the a lot of knowledge, a member of a profession or any person who earns uh, a living from uh, specified professional activities. Now notice, it says, A, what is a profession? And it makes the point that most professions earn a living from professing and vowing. Another definition uh, given, a professional is one engaged in specific activity as one's main paid occupation rather than a pastime. This definition or this uh, opinion also relates to whether, for example, some athletes are professional, some are amateurs. But in terms of healthcare, we tend to look more at the former. A member of a profession earns a living from a specified professional activities. There's some modern criteria for all professionals. Let me underline all, for all professionals. One, credentials. All professionals have some form of credentialing. All of them have to have somebody that certifies that they are professional. And the certification is because of the possession of a specific body of knowledge. Every profession, dentists, vets, medicine, nursing, you all as professionals will possess a specific body of knowledge. And as Dr. Espinay said, you are expected to uh, have ethical standards of behavior and practice. And also, I think it is important to accept that almost all, I would say all professionals belong to some professional body, some association. And also, there are always laws, regulations, either uh, legal, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, standards set by your own discipline or standards set by our government, but there are regulatory bodies that guide the behavior. There's a, there, there is, for example, the nursing body. A nursing body uh, sets certain standards which it expects its members to perform. 
Now, the profession possession of a specific body of knowledge, I think is very important. I want all of you at the beginning of your training to accept the need to work, to have this specific body of knowledge. That is what is going to separate you from many other professionals. Now, in addition to the formal criteria, which, has, which every professional will have, I like to say that a healthcare professional has one special one that many others do not have. I have found throughout my 71 years, one of the things that characterizes good healthcare professionals is compassion. Compassion, uh, a deep awareness and a willingness to know another's suffering uh, and a desire to relieve it. So it's not sympathy, not feeling for and feeling, you know, what a poor fellow. No, it's different than that. As one of my teachers used to say, it is a good idea to wear the pajamas of another's illness. In addition to the formal criteria, I would like to see, I, I, I recognize over the years that the really good healthcare professionals had compassion. They have felt for and felt with the another's suffering. And in addition to that, they had this desire, this burning desire to relieve it. So I want to impress on you that all professionals have this, uh, the, this corpus of knowledge, uh, some knowledge, all professionals will have credentials, et cetera, et cetera. But you as healthcare professionals, I would like to see all of you start from now to believe that compassion is one of the things that will separate you from many other uh, professions. Now, I say to you that you should have a certain body of knowledge. Now, why do I show you a goldfish? You will ask. What does a goldfish have to do with a body of knowledge? And therein, I'll tell you a story which I heard many years ago. And some of you will remember. Some of you probably remember this. This is the only thing you remember from my talk. A little boy was given a goldfish by his, gun, his grandfather. And he loved this goldfish. And he cared for this goldfish. And the goldfish started to swim slowly one day. So he took the goldfish to the vet and the goldfish, the vet uh, prescribed medicine for the goldfish. And the little boy came home and he gave the goldfish the medicine, fed it, looked after it. And one day, however, he came and found the goldfish dead. And his grandfather, he complained his grandfather in tears, my goldfish is dead. And I did everything, I fed him. The grandfather said to him, but did you change the water? Did you look after the water? The boy said, no. He says, that is why the goldfish died. And the point I'm making to you is this. You will develop a lot of knowledge about the individual. You will develop a lot of knowledge about individual cats, dogs, horses, etc. But all of the persons with whom you deal have water around them. They live in an environment. So the healthcare professional, right from the start, you have to think of not only that corpus of knowledge that deals with the individual, but you also like to have to think of that corpus of knowledge that deals with the water as well, that deals with what is around the individual. And from now, from the age of 18, you can start to be sensitive if you're not already, but what are the social correlates that determine whether a person gets ill or not? And uh, Dr. Sine referred to Hippocrates. Hippocrates is famous for many things. He also uh, advises doctors that they should support their teachers. I've never found a doctor yet that came back and said he wanted to support me, but that's neither here nor there. But Hippocrates also uh, elaborated a theory on airs and waters. Now, what Hippocrates was doing was saying is not only the individual, but the air, the water, the places around the individual, those places, around, those things around the goldfish that were very important for the survival of the goldfish. And Hippocrates wrote, and this is an introduction to his text, uh, he says, whoever wishes to investigate medicine properly, it should be healthcare properly, although he wrote medicine. 
In the first place, consider the season of the year, then the winds, the hot and the cold, then the quality of the waters. And what hypocrisy was saying is not only the individual, but what surrounds the individual that is of critical importance. And even at age 18, you have to start to think that way. You have your eyes and ears have to be open to what is around you, what is a social environment. And we say that if you're going to look at health, and this has to do with all aspects of health, veterinary health, uh, human health, whatever branch of health is not only uh, the health care, the social and community context, the education, economic stability, what the neighborhood is like, because you know that people that come from one part of Trinidad are more likely to get uh, ill and treatment from come another part of Trinidad, the neighborhood and built environment. So right from the beginning is not only the goldfish, but it is the water around the goldfish that is also of importance. So the second aspect of it is accountability. And Professor C. Mongol was quite right in pointing out that this has become of critical importance. The healthcare professional must understand and internalize social accountability. Now, I am very, uh, I, I'm not saying I'm dogmatic, but I'm emphatic that it is a society to which doctors are responsible. Uh, obligation to society, your response to your individual patients, et cetera, but it's also as a profession, obligation to society to accept responsibility and account for one's action. And I say social in this context, it means relating to human society. So all healthcare professionals have a built-in obligation to society to accept responsibility. Now, uh, I, I, used to, I used to teach at uh, another university and one of the courses I used to teach was in contract theory. Uh, there's a very, uh, a lot that goes into contract theory, but as I just want to emphasize one aspect that is relevant to social accountability. In contract theory, there are principles and agents, and the agent is responsible and accountable for actions to meet the principal's goals and needs. Let's say that you have won a lot of money and you want to build a house in Mount Saint, near Mount St. Benedict, and you are got to call in uh, an architect. Now you are the principal and the architect is the agent, and the architect is responsible to you for his actions to meet your needs. You need a nice house. So your agent is that architect and that architect is responsible to you as the principal for having a nice house. Now, in the case of healthcare professionals, the principal is society and the agent is a health professional. And the same way you need the architect to provide you with a good house, society needs a healthcare professional to provide good health. So the issue of accountability is that which makes the agent responsible and accountable for what he and she does to ensure that the needs of the principal are met. I want you to remember this. This is a very, very important concept, accountability. The agent, in the case of uh, uh, our societies, the people, you, we, the voters, we are the principals and the politicians are the agents, although they don't, they often think of it the other way around. But in truth, they should be responsible for us. In the case of healthcare professionals, society is the principal and the health professionals are responsible society for good health. I must make the point, of course, that when you build a house, it's not only the architect that is going to be uh, uh, involved, you're going to have the builders, you're going to have people who make the cement, the carpenters, et cetera. So healthcare professionals are not the only agents responsible for the construct of a good society. Now, what are the means of assuring social accountability? Is the training institutions, mentorship, the law of peer pressure. I put the training institutions first because I have always believed with a passion that our university our, our training institute is one of the institutions that is primarily responsible for instilling into students right from day one, 
the need for social accountability. So I'm so pleased when uh, uh, Professor Simongol included this because I'm sure he would agree with me, the responsibility of the medical, uh, faculty of medical sciences to say from day one, look, we as a uh, institution, we are going to instill into you the idea, repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. You have a responsibility, you are accountable to society. The other one is mentorship, as you mentioned before, you, uh, when you see your mentors being, social, being socially accountable, you tend to follow. And you don't want to get to the law, but the law does exist to make sure that uh, there is social accountability and also peer pressure. As was mentioned before, your peers can exert pressure on you and give you good ex uh, 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 a good example to follow. Now, social accountability has been defined by the World Health Organization uh, again, the obligation of medical schools to direct their education, research, and service activities towards addressing priority health conditions of the community, region, and nation. Right again, in, uh, invoking the responsibility of the medical profession, of the training institutions. And I put up this pent pent Pentagon uh, to show the several socially accountable agents, health professionals is one, but also we want to emphasize academic institutions having this responsibility. Policymakers and administrators also have the, uh, the responsibility. Uh, they are also accountable to society for the kind of health that society wants, needs, and deserves. Now, I want to leave you with some takeaways. If you want to remember, uh, there are going to be three things I'm going to ask you to remember. And when I meet some of you in, in St. Augustine, I'm going to ask some of you, did you remember these three things? I want you to remember the criteria for a professional, for any professional, but for a healthcare professional, I want you to remember and accept that compassion is absolutely critical. The second one, please remember the image of the healthiest goldfish. It is not only the treatment of the goldfish, but it's the water around the goldfish that is of fundamental importance. And right from now, you can start to cultivate this awareness of the environment which allows society to be healthy. And as a healthcare professional, you are accountable, but you're only one of the agents accountable to society for its good health. I would have said, when I was at your stage 70 years ago, I would have liked someone to have told me this. There's also one thing, which I'm not sure that uh, Professor Simongol would agree with. I want you all to have fun. This six years of your life is a very important time of your life when you explore things. And uh, it is important to do your work, but it's important to also be involved in other things. It's important to join the clubs. It's important to play games. It's important to argue about politics, about girls, about various things. These things, this interaction that you have in these six years, four to six years of life, are the, will be, in retrospect, some of the happiest days of your life. So with that, I say to you, good luck as you start off on, the, on your career. And when I come to St. Augustine, I'm sure I'll meet one of you and ask you, do you remember the goldfish? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sir George, for your enlightening lecture to our students and colleagues on the social account issue, which is a very, very critical issue for our medical school. As we all are aware that the now accreditation requirement for our all medical school as a social accountability. And also you rightly pointed out about compassion for the health professional. That is particularly what we talk about human attributes besides the academic ability. The healthcare professional also must be mindful about human attributes, which really articulate clearly in your lecture. And now, particularly we are talking about technically we call empathy. So the physician or the healthcare professional 
besides their knowledge and skill they must be also empathetic in their practice okay with that now i would like to invite any questions and comments from our colleagues from our audience the new students most welcome any questions and comment for sir george you you know professor sir when there are no no questions I, the only two options either has been clear or it's been as dark as mud everything has been so obscure that no one understood a word of it there are only one of those two options but uh, 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 and one thing I, I must point out to stu the students, I tried hard to make up the time because as people who knew me, I am- Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Sorry to disturb you. Um, you well said, ab well said about the uh, professionalism by explaining with the goldfish story, sir. That's very understandable and it's clear. It's not only the individual that we need to see about, we need to see about the surroundings of the individual. Um, it's very clear. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I was going to say, Professor Sir, those who know me, know that I'm pathologically obsessed with time. So, uh, and I, this is one of the virtues I would like to encourage your students to inculcate. Uh, time, time yes, is important. Yes, time. yes, so, yes sir, Judge, and we do know, do know you, and I have also multiple occasion of inter interacting with you uh, personally also, face to face. And thank you very much for your support to our faculty and the university and the university will continue to benefit with your visionary guidance and directions and particularly our faculty of medical sciences thank you sir now our next topic is on careers in health professions is a very interesting area because it is not that when you do MBBS, you can be only doctor, but when you do nursing, you can be only nurses. And choosing of career is very critical to shape your career itself. So we, with that topic, now I will be inviting Dr. Ayan Ramnarayan for this presentation. And Dr. Ramnarayan, is a consultant, cardiothoracic surgeon at the very own Eric William Medical Science Complex since 2007. He is a graduate of Presentation College and the University of the West Indies. He has completed his postgraduate surgical and cardiothoracic surgical training in UK, in various hospitals in London, Glasgow, Liverpool, and Birmingham. And he has also achieved his fellowship from Royal College of Surgeon Edinburgh in surgery in general and cardiothoracic surgery. So after a long stint in UK, since his return in Trinidad, he has been serving in various capacities in administrative also. He was also an acting head or medical chief of staff. And he has been teaching our both undergraduate and postgraduate students and being a mentor for them also. So with that, now I would like to invite Dr. Ramnarayan to the virtual podium to speak on careers in health professions. Welcome, Dr. Ramnarayan. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Professor Sa. Uh, are you able to see my um, my screen? Yes, yes, we do. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Professor Sa again, as our host and Dean Professor Simongo, uh, former Chancellor Professor Emeritus, Sir George Allen, Deputy Dean Professor Zenwaka, Professor Espinay, who I've not seen for more than 30 years. Good to see you again. 
and good morning to other presenters, especially Professor Ruddock, who's who I follow. So I feel a little bit um, a bit out of place uh, between Professor George Allen and Professor Ruddock. And of course, welcome to all new students of Faculty of Medical Sciences. And before anything else, I'd just like to say, you know, congratulations. You have now entered a profession. Congratulations to all of you new students starting off in first year in whichever one of the many faculties. And these faculty, these faculty medical sciences has different departments. The one that most people um, are familiar with, of course, is medicine, which was actually the very first faculty that started off the University of West Indies. But subsequent to that, the Faculty of Medical Sciences has expanded. And we've got Oscar Ocho here, uh, Dr. Ocho, who is in charge of the nursing school. There are others here from optometry, pharmacy, dentistry, veterinary medicine. And we also allow a lot number of electives to come here from all of these specialties, as well as there's a pre-health professionals program. But this is just a start to a profession. And why I keep saying a profession is because once you've developed a skill and certified here and registered with whatever board you are, you have a skill that will gain you employment some way or the other. So congratulations to getting into the, one of those fields. But then what happens after that? So you get a professional degree. Where do you go from there? And it's important to have an idea from now what you want to do later on. Uh, there are a whole variety of different ways to go. And I, I try to show on this one, sh one shot all the, the possibilities, but it is impossible. For one, if you have a professional degree, the most obvious one is to continue on in the profession, either, either in the public sector or the private sector. And quite often, you may require going into postgraduate training to, to continue on and, and develop yourself. Or you could branch off into an allied career based on your undergraduate training. Further on, as things go by, you may enter into administration, as happened to me. Um, when I became a consultant, I became an administrator for the department and work on it. So administrative skills are always helpful later on. Sometimes the people decide to go into academia and research and education. In Trinidad, like you've seen all the professors here, they're all involved in academia in terms of publishing and doing their research, in addition to educating those coming up under them. Or quite often, someone might decide, okay, this is not the career for me, and enter into a completely alternate career. Some go into politics, some go into business, some go into a different profession altogether. But you need to prepare for the rest of your professional life. And I'm hoping I give you a, a little flavor of what's necessary over here. First of all, have a plan. I know a lot of people who would enter medicine may say, oh, I want to be a pediatrician or I want to be a surgeon. And, and then once they get into it and they get a flavor for it throughout the training, their, their aims will change. I know it certainly happened to me. I didn't think of even being a surgeon when, when I was in my training. And you must always be prepared to adapt, seeing what's going on. Always do your best. These sound like um, words that you hear from your, from your teachers and your parents all through, but you've got to get through your exams at the end of the day. And you need to know where you're going, which direction. It is essential in a pressured specialty, in a pressure, special, uh, pressured profession to have an outlet for all the stress that builds up, whether it's your family, hobby, sport, whatever it is, physical activity is probably the best. One thing that I learned a little later on in my training was to start a portfolio early. What's a portfolio? A portfolio is a record of all your, it's not quite a, C, a curriculum vitae. It's a, a, a bit more detailed than your CV. For example, if you do any short courses, you must keep a record of that. If you've done a, a, a paper that you presented, you must have an information on that. Um, I've, I've been involved in hiring SHOs and doing interviews. And when I go to them and they said, well, have you done any presentations? And they said, yes, we did one in my uh, third year mandatory one. I said, well, what was it on? And they start talking about it uh, or they may not know about it. I said, but you did the work. Where is it? You're, you're looking for another job up the line. And I want to see as someone who's hiring someone like that, whether they are critical thinkers, if they've done the experience, et cetera. Then the next important thing is to network. Learn how to network. And uh, uh, towards the end, I'll talk a little bit more about what the importance of networking and how to do it. 
And once you develop a profession, you must be aware of the issues within your profession. You must have a stance on them. So once again, we've got a number of different departments in faculty of medical sciences. And whereas I give you a flavor for what an overall professional will need to do, each one of these different careers will have their own pathways that are involved, right? The one I'm most familiar, of course, with is medicine. And with medicine, if you decide to continue on after your MBBS in clinical medicine, most people stay on as hospital doctors, as surgeons, physicians, pediatricians, too many different uh, specialties to mention here. But in each of these would require a period of postgraduate training. A lot of them are available locally, but we need to supplement our training quite often with overseas centers, or like you can do like myself, when I did cardiothoracic surgery, there's no facility in Trinidad to do that. So I went overseas and spent many years overseas in the UK training before returning. Once I finished with that, I returned home. Um, I, I worked both in the hospital at Eric Williams as well as in the private sector. And that's one other thing I, I don't talk about in careers. You must have, a, a, many people have a mix and match kind of practice where they've got one job in the hospital service and one job in the private sector. Now, there are a whole uh, batch of different ways this can go. And there, there are others apart from the hospital doctors in clinical medicine. There's also the public health and primary care ones who are under pressure these days uh, from primary care for all the cough and colds coming through and making sure they're not um, uh, infected. And the public health, which serves the needs of the nation in terms of ensuring that the needs for the country are met. Administration, as I said, was important to me. I mean, when I returned to Trinidad uh, and as a consultant surgeon, I was the administrator, surgical administrator, head of department for many years, uh, acted as chief of stats, et cetera. And, and thankfully, some of my management training came in helpful. Of course, there are many of my colleagues have also gone off into academia and research and education, like Professor Simangula and many of the professors here on this um, uh, session today. And again, many, many doctors have used the MBBS. I know one guy who didn't, um, after finishing his MBBS, did not do his internship. In fact, I know a couple of them did not complete internship and went off to join family businesses. So have an idea about where you'd like to go. Nursing programs. Now, this is really taken from uh, Dr. Ocho. And, and for details on this, it's probably better to consult with him about it. But suffice it to say, there are three nursing schools in Trinidad, but the one we're concentrating on is the UWI one. <clears throat> and there's a pre-registration Bachelor of Science in Nursing that's offered here. It's a four-year degree, which includes um, clinical training up on the ward. But post-registration, you can also do training in special education, like oncology, intensive care. Um, this can be part-time as well as full-time, or even nursing education, if you want to be a nurse educator. And then there's also the master's programs that are offered. Once you develop this uh, portfolio, or this, this undergraduate and postgraduate degrees is where you go from there. There are a number of different career opportunities in nursing. Nursing is one universal skill that's short all over the world. It's not that I'm trying to get you to go overseas, but you've seen recently that in the US in particular, they're headhunting nurses who can make a tremendous amount of money because they're so short of it because the hospitals are overwhelmed with COVID right now. In clinical nursing, you've got typical things like general nursing, psychiatric, community health nursing, et cetera. And then there's specialist ones further than that, like in the operating theater, advanced nurse practitioners and specialists. When I worked in the UK, uh, quite a lot of the prescribing was done by uh, nurses and they were doing endoscopy, nurse-led endoscopy. We had clinical nurse specialists, some of whom I was involved in training in the cardiothoracic unit. Um, so there, there are a number of different branches and you can more or less make your own way once you have that basic degree in terms of whichever direction you want to go to. Nurse educator like uh, Dr. Ocho is there as well. Or you can stick around in the public sector um, and go up the line there, head nurse, nursing supervisors, etc., all the way up to chief nurse, nursing officer. Optometry has been only recently added to the Faculty of Medical Sciences um, uh, within the last five to 10 years, I can't remember. And there are the local options, once you've qualified with that, is you either work in the public sector 
there's limited in the public sector uh, openings for uh, optometry, even though that was why it was set up in the first place. There's also private sector, either in an optometric practice where you're getting your glasses or with an ophthalmology practice. Uh, some people even open their own labs or, or practices. Or you can go into academics and research with the University of the West Indies, which is really new. Um, and the academics there would probably be down the line of teaching, of education. In addition to that, we have a number of, of um, opticians who are trained and are looking for employment right now where they have opportunities uh, regionally and they can also learn to practice internationally in the US or Canada or the UK, but they have different requirements if you're moving on to those areas after you completed your BSc. The pharmacists, there's a BSc in pharmacy offered here. And when you come out as a pharmacist, you can either go public sector or private sector, a number of jobs or an allied career uh, in terms of being a rep or being into research or into administration and management. Um, we, we, they, there's academia and research more along the education line in Trinidad. There's not that much in terms of postgraduate um, uh, education here. Or you can, you can enter into an alternate career as a pharmacist. We've got one who's the Minister of Health now. He's actually, his basic degree is a, as a pharmacist. And of course, business. So there's so many opportunities once you've had your basic degree. This was um, a book that was recommended to me, Letters to a Young Pharmacist, giving little key pointers along the way of some pharmacists who wish they had that information, they, this advice to them, given to them when they were in their training. Dentistry, the DDS degree. Now to stay on, there, there's options to stay on in clinical dentistry, either in the hospital or in the private sector or in Trinidad primary care as well. But most of these require postgraduate training. And once you get the postgraduate training, you will get additional training, like whether it's orthodontistry, where there's a considerable period of time for training, which includes training in, in, in surgery, as well as in medicine, um, pediatric dentistry, prosthetics, et cetera. But most of the postgraduate training is, it would require you to go overseas for that. In the DDS program, there isn't that much re, uh, opportunity for research, but you can, if, if you're a keen person, get involved with, um, I'm sure Dr. Smith here will, will help you out. We're getting a research project going on. And then of course, there are always alternate careers. In veterinary medicine, and veterinary medicine is probably the one with the, bright, the largest um, number of um, uh, subspecialties to be looking at, right? Once you finish as a vet, most people prefer to work either as a small animal, as a small animal vets in either in the public sector or the private sector. But there's just so much scope. If you're going to do postgraduate training, a lot of it has to be done overseas. Um, but in addition to the small animal and uh, equine uh, veterinary medicine, the government and industry both have a considerable number of vacancies for vets in farming and livestock rearing and poultry and, um, and porcine. Uh, these are important for food security. The private industry has a lot of openings up as well, not locally, but in vet pharmaceutical and research and virology. You see how important virology is um, taken into consideration these days. So having covered the, uh, uh, just giving you a little taste, a little flavor of what's available for you as a, a career in whatever chosen profession you have decided to be in. Just a couple of uh, tips on what to look out for. You must be networking and from early. As a medical profession, you need to network. And we say why we network. We talk about types of networking, virtual networking, and some top tips I talk about. So why you network? There are three types of people in this world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder, hey, what just happened here, right? And it's important networkers are people who make things happen. Network is a pathway to career progress. It's not economic or political power, but the power to influence, share ideas, create change, learn progress, and even mentor others. It's essential for passing exams. I, I remember this way back when I was sitting in your seats there with um, now leaving secondary school, going to Jamaica where I studied um, for my MBBS. And the, the field of, of medicine in general and, and preclinical is so vast. 
um, you have to spot, you have to work with your, your colleagues and decide what you want to study for these exams and things like that. The, the, the sheer uh, vastness of the um, syllabus is so great. You have to know, you have to network with your colleagues who are in your class and your teachers as well to find out you know, what are the important things. Um, for, for us, I think there was a lot more uh, in terms of the basic science knowledge, in terms of the anatomy in particular, and you, you, know, you know how horrendous anatomy can be. So it was helpful that we shared the burden and we also were pointing in the right directions by networking with our teachers in terms of what were the important things that could come for exams. You need to keep up, once you've qualified, keep up with movement and trends within your own specialty. Um, in terms of what's going on in Trinidad and Tobago right now, the, the certain um, special, and this is all over the world actually, certain specialists are more important than others right now because they're so short. There is a shortage of intensive care doctors and medical doctors, mainly because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, when I was in training and I did surgery, I decided, okay, I'm going to be a surgeon. I didn't know what type of surgeon I was going to be. So I enjoyed every different bit of surgery I was involved with. And the reason I chose thoracic surgery is because I realized there was nobody here apart from Mr. Penko who was doing thoracic surgery at that time. And when I returned, he was still the only one really doing any thoracic surgery. So I saw the opportunity in the future. And, and now I've got more colleagues, but it's still a very specialized area. Networking is also essential for accessing new opportunities apart from that and hearing what's going on, whether it's a scholarship, a sponsorship, uh, a new job coming up. You don't find out about these without networking. And it's important for becoming an influencer or a thought leader. It's important to be networking because you'll be at the table instead of on the menu. Those who don't understand what's going on, don't check and see what's going on, they'll be on the menu. Types of networking. There are a number of different types available. These are taken from, uh, when I was asked to give this talk about careers in medicine, I thought, well, I'd probably con uh, contact somebody who's in human resources. And this is the benefit of Regal who helped me out with this. Now, volunteering is a wonderful way to not only meet new people, but also develop new skills and give back to the community. And there have been a ton of people who've been um, involved in volunteering recently in terms of the vaccination programs and not just doctors, also doctors, vets, um, pharmacists, uh, dentists, etc. Business. This is more a tool for in businesses. Joining your businesses and associations means that you can be involved in important discussions about national issues, et cetera. And there are many service groups that help out both with volunteer and with business that help their business. And within your profession, uh, within our profession, I'm involved with the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association, the Society of Surgeons, and you must be engaged in your own uh, profession especially to ensure that you maintain your continued professional development scheme and keep up with trends and technology. Virtual networking is much more important these days. Uh, it's said that COVID brought us kicking and streaming into the 21st century because now the world is a much smaller place. We've had virtual meetings with people from all over the world. You've seen today, uh, Professor Espinek uh, talking to you from Australia. But you must curate your social media profiles. That means, you know, take care of what information is out there. You've got to clarify your goals and set the scene. The camera on and name yourself, you know, simple things like don't call yourself iPad, call yourself by your name, right? And engage people while you're talking. Because, of course, we're no longer sitting around a table. It's a virtual table. So how do I know who's out there? Um, thank the host, which I made sure and did initially and follow through. That's the most important thing about virtual networking. Your digital handshake is a virtual meeting substitute for physical shaking of hands. And you can send out your information, look into the camera, lean slightly forward, shoulders and eyes focusing ahead. These are important things that will be coming up more and more as we are no longer meeting in person as often as we did before. Be genuine and not robotic. I hope I'm not feeling all these points I'm giving you over here. Uh, that'll be a disaster, wouldn't it? Tips from the masters, listen to learn. Do your research before the meeting so you can ask the relevant question. There's no use making up the questions as you go along. Build on small goals. Um, and you know, if you're looking for a job or a, 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 a little 
and edge in. You know, you've got to be prepared for elevator pitch when somebody asks you, who are you? What do you do? And be prepared to give more than you get back from them. Introduce people to other people. That, that also helps yourself. Learn to accept rejection. It happens. Ask for help and always keep your word. And again, I make a plug here for keep a portfolio. Up to today, I have my portfolio, which is every paper I publish. I've got it there, stuck there. So if someone asks me about that paper, I can pull it out. Uh, it's electronically available as well. Even in a pandemic, even in a tragedy, there are opportunities for you to progress. And it's important that you look at it and be aware of what's going on in your own um, society and or your own specialty field. Like I just told you, with this pandemic, it's highlighted so many different deficiencies in our system that if I were someone just graduating, I would I would seriously look at what the deficiencies in Trinidad, such as virology, such as intensive care medicine, um, such as testing, laboratory testing, where the deficiencies are, and move into that field. And most importantly, I'd like to uh, to to. To echo um, Sir George Allen's words, enjoy what you do. I enjoy what I do, and I'm amazed that people pay me to do what I would do for free. That that's the facts of it, right? Um, I, I read up on it, I, I publish on it, I teach on it, and I really do enjoy what I do. And that's it. Um, a short presentation. Hopefully, I've given you all a flavor of what a career in medical profession is and uh, give you a little bit of guidelines in terms of what you need to do, which include networking, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and for your presentation about our careers in health professions. And it was very informative. Now, I would like to invite uh, questions and comments from the our audience. So feel free if you have any questions for Dr. Ramnarayan. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Shivanan, and I'm also interested in wanting to become a surgeon. And my question for you, doctor, is can you please share with us the biggest setback if you've en ever encountered any that I'm sure you encountered? Can you share with us what it was and how you dealt with it, especially as a medical student and more so somebody coming from the Caribbean? Well, as a medical student, I didn't have that many setbacks. It was just put your head down and work and hopefully make some time for other things on life outside. And I was pretty fortunate. I got through pretty easily. And I'll tell you why it was easy for me, easier than I think for most. It's because I went to medical school in Barbados at that time for uh, three years in Jamaica when I got through that. And in Barbados at that time, my whole class, my whole class was 12 people. So I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one teaching going on with Professor Waldron and, and Dr. Raj, um, Dr. Ramesh, who were across there. So they made sure they ensured that I got through mine because there was a lot more personal interaction with the students, not like now when your groups are slightly larger. So the undergraduate part was pretty straightforward. What, what was difficult after that was deciding which branch of medicine to go into. And for me, um, it was, you know, I sat down after I'd finished and spoke to one of my colleagues and he says, you know, well, it's easy. Do you want, do you like operating or don't you? And I thought, okay, I, I certainly would prefer to operate than do those long uh, laborious ward rounds that, that are done. And that made it easy for me. I just entered along a surgical pathway. In my case, I did my requirements in Trinidad before going off to the UK to complete the fellowship exams. And one of the most difficult things at the time was obtaining an appropriate job in the UK. And I managed to stay ahead of the curve and always be employed, always been having moving on to another job that would pr promote myself because of networking, because of publishing, presenting, making sure I got my exams, etc. But I guess what happened was, as a, a good surgical trainee, um, the, the pressure was always there to say, you know, you're not getting enough operative experience. And it's the same thing experience all over the world, whether it's, it was in England or over here at my juniors, you know, not getting enough surgical experience, actual experience going into the operating theater and operating. And what we did about that is we developed um, surrogate ways of learning how to operate. We did, that's how we addressed it. 
being a foreigner in the in the UK operating, um, it was also difficult to sometimes to get positions when you're up against um, uh, citizens of the UK or even uh, European citizens. But I still managed to get on because I made sure I knew the game before before I entered the game and then played it along with their rules. I didn't always know it. That's why I'm saying in terms of the hardest thing was learning the game, learning the networking, learning all that. So I'm hopeful that you know this talk I'm giving you here would help focus you onto that. Excellent. Thank you so very much for the insight. Thank you very much. Uh, any okay. other question? Uh, someone had asked about dentistry and um, uh, optometry and all the rest of it. Um, certainly they could contact the, I'm, I'm sorry, I wish I had the details on it, but I'm sure your heads of department will be able to give you all a bit more in-depth knowledge on those issues once you've started. Okay. Yeah. But was there any particular question about those? So, well, as Professor Simangal was um, suggesting, you know, you know, the more you learn and the more you you focus on something, you the more and more I learn about less and less. I'm a specialist cardiothoracic surgeon, so until one day I'd probably know absolutely everything about nothing at all. But this this uh, covering careers has has actually opened up my eyes to say, look, that despite the differences between them, there are several similarities for you guys to look out for. And I advocate for networking and keeping a portfolio. If it's two things that I, I would put forward and echo one thought that Professor uh, Allen has said, which is enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in the absence of any other further questions to our Dr. Ramnarayan, I would like to thank that Dr. Ramnarayan for your very much informative presentation and enlightening the students about the careers in the healthcare professions. And on behalf of the Dean, on behalf of the faculty, we would like to register our special thanks for your time and effort. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> so moving forward, students. Now we have the new presentation that is on gender issues and healthcare profession in the Caribbean. The topic, it will be presented by our esteemed Professor Amirita, Professor Roda Redak, whose specialization is gender, social change and development. And he, sir, my sincere apology, she was the deputy principal of the St. Augustine campus. And after completing her undergraduate studies at the University of West Indies, Mona and St. Augustine campuses, she completed her master's at the Institute of, for Social Studies, The Hague, and the doctorate at the University of Amsterdam. And she is very active in national and Caribbean women's movement and other social movements. She is the recipient of numerous national, regional, and international award, including the Triennial CARICOM Award for Women in 2002, an honorary doctorate from the University of Western Cape, South Africa in 2012. Recently, Professor Redock was the project director of the Action Research Project and campaign the Break the Silence and Child Sexual Abuse, which was developed, which developed the blue teddy symbol. Prof. Redock has numerous publications, including nine books, out of which two are two were the award winning, three monographs, and edited four special journal issues and over 75 peer review articles published to her credit and book chapter. Professor Redock is currently an executive member of the International Sociological Association 2018 to 2022 and an elected expert of the UN Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the membership of that panel 
is effective from 2019 until 2023 with that resume now i would like to invite professor redock to our virtual podium to speak on the title that gender issues and healthcare profession in the caribbean welcome prof redock over to you thank you very much uh Professor Sarr, congratulations on your professorship. And also congratulations to all the incoming students who are entering into a new adventure. And I must thank the Faculty of Medical Sciences for inviting me to give this very important talk. And I hope that this talk will have some influence on the incoming students and on the faculty in terms of its future development. So if I may, I would like to share my screen. Okay, thank you very much. So first of all, this is the general outline of my presentation. We will look at biology and society. We will discuss the concept of gender, the and of intersectionality. And then we look at issues related to gender differentials in health biology and society. Now, while all human beings are biological, that is, they have certain physical or anatomical characteristics, each of us is shaped by the interaction between our biology and society. That is, the social and cultural environment through socialization and social interactions with others from birth. Now, some of those social environments vary. For example, it could be the economics of the situation, your income, class, wealth, poverty, inequality, ethnicity, race, and color, geography, whether you're living a rural or urban setting, education and cultural traditions, what you learn and experience in school with your peers, media, and popular culture, religion and belief systems, patterns of family and community, and of course, patterns of gender relations. So in other words, your biology then is shaped through all of these characteristics that we experience. And it is that interaction that results in what we refer to in a way as health. Now, 19th century medicine concluded that woman was mentally and physically inferior to men, that their symptoms of fatigue, irritability, and anxiety among middle or high-class women was diagnosed as hysteria or neurasthenia. And many of these disorders were attributed to the female reproductive system. And disease was considered the natural state of women. As you probably know, uh, the term hysterectomy for the removal of the wound uh, comes from the word hysteria. And it was suggested that a lot of women's maladies and disease and disorders originated in her womb. The womb, of course, was a major biological or anatomical difference between women and men. Similarly, uh, menstruation was considered impure and as malignant, and this generated ideas about women in relation to certain stages of the menstrual cycle. For example, menopause was thought to render women unbalanced or deranged. Now, up to recently, the US Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders of the American Psychological Association still considers men as a standard behavioral pattern. So women are more frequently diagnosed as, but to the extent that they vary from the standard. And as a result, they are often diagnosed with more pathologies. Similarly, uh, today still science, medicine and engineering often take the young, white, able-bodied 70 kg male as the norm. 
And when it's studied, other populations, for example, women, gender diverse people, the elderly, larger or smaller people, and non-white groups are frequently considered as deviations from this norm. And this has affected research in many areas. And this, these two diagrams, the first one uh, was created in the 1940s to set standards for the human body and architecture and mechanical design. The second one is taken from a 2004 edition of Gray's Anatomy, which details anatomical features using the male body. And female bodies, when they appear, are used to show where they deviate from males. So in other words, in to a large extent, in a lot of learned science, and I hope science that is changing, uh, saw the male body as the norm <clears throat> and women's bodies as a deviation for that norm. And this was also characteristic of health research and other aspects of health practice. Now the term gender is used to provide a conceptual distinction. I say conceptual because it's more difficult to really make a physical or real separation. A conceptual distinction between the biological or anatomical differences of being male and female, which is often referred to as sex, and the socially constructed or socially and culturally determined differences and meanings attached to masculinity and femininity. In other words, uh, in the traditional understanding of the word gender, one is born male or female, or sometimes you, are, you have ambiguous sex, but it is through your interactions with others that you learn the appropriate way to be masculine or feminine. You learn how to be a man and a woman. In other words, these are not given at birth. So sex is used therefore to refer to the biological and anatomical, which was initially understood as unchangeable. And today we are seeing many challenges to that. And gender was understood as social, as having the potential for change and discussed in terms of masculine and feminine. Now masculinity and femininity are defined in opposition to each other. And I think this is so important. Therefore, what is masculine is simply what is not feminine. And of course, these change from time to time. In other words, they are oppositional context, concepts. So as femininity changes, so does masculinity and vice versa in some respects. So in all societies, masculinity and maleness are normally more highly valued than femininity. But this is, this we hope is changing. Now, one sex gender identity is a fundamental identity of human beings. And we find it difficult to engage with each other outside of this kind of identity. So although we may not be conscious of it, virtually all of our actions, our thoughts, and our beliefs are gendered. So by gendered, we mean that they are shaped by ideas, values, norms, and beliefs about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. In other words, from the time one is born and they identify your genitalia, then certain characteristics, behaviors, attitudes are assumed from birth. That is why when a baby is born, what is the first fact that must be established? What is the first question that is asked? Anyone would like to volunteer? Okay. Oh, is it a boy or girl? Is it a boy or girl? Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Unanimous. That is the first question that uh, that's asked. We don't ask people if the, if the child is healthy, you know, whatever. That's the first question. And why do we ask that question? We ask that question because we find it difficult to deal with gender ambiguity 
if we don't know if it's a boy or girl, sometimes you don't know how high you could throw that poor baby into the air. You don't know how hard you could slap it to make it cry when it's born. If you know if you know if it's a boy or girl from birth, you already have gendered expectations and gendered patterns that you begin to automatically impose on this poor child. So gender therefore refers to this social construction of difference, but it also is relates to the meanings and the values assigned and associated with our gender and sexual identities. In some traditions long ago, if a boy was born, there'd be feasting and merriment in the community, but if a girl, they'd be crying and sobbing in some Western countries, men would give out cigarettes. Now, of course, cigarettes we know are quite unhealthy. If a boy was born, I'm not sure what they did if a girl was born. And generally in our language, the feminine is always ascribed to a lower value. For example, king, queen, master, mistress, dog, bitch. And you could think of any other set of um, dual terms, the value, of the one that is defined as feminine is always lower or actually questionable. So the concept of gender therefore allows us to understand that bio also allows us to understand that biological sex does not always conform with gender identities. So for example, you may be born with certain anatomy, but your identity of who you are may vary and we'll come back to that later on. So the aim of gender socialization, therefore, is to ensure that our social and gendered behaviors align with our biology, which is not always the case. And many of us may recall things that parents or peers in school told us, stop doing that. You're looking like a girl. Stop doing that. You're not a boy. Stop doing that. So, so these are the mechanisms through which our behaviors are made to align with our, the assumed gender, sex, or gender identity. Now, gender so socialization, therefore, is very important. As I mentioned, when we are born, we don't know who we are. We don't know if we are male, female. It is through our interactions that we learn this. And gender is also flexible and changing. And this is why what is masculine or feminine in one generation may not be in another. Similarly, what is masculine or feminine in one society may not be in another. So for example, you could think of your parents' generation and your own generation, or maybe your grandparents' generation. Could you think of something that was not masculine or feminine then that is now and vice versa? And while you think of it, I just have here some photos of books on masculinities because you know there was a view that this is what I say that that men masculinity or femininity may not be the same in different parts of the world. So here we have this book here on Islamic masculinities, African masculinities. Of course, Africa is huge. Islam is diverse. So even to have these big titles uh, does not recognize a lot of the internal diversity change in Chinese masculinity. So here we see that masculinities are changing. And then we see here masculinities and the nation in a modern world. So we see there the ways in which masculinities are related to the idea of the nation. So we see therefore that gender is a very critical concept. And just looking at the issue of masculinities, we see how diverse it could be, how varied it is and also how much research is being carried out in that area. So coming back to that question, can anyone has an idea of something that was masculine or feminine in your parents or grandparents' generation that has changed now? Five seconds to respond. Hi, good evening. Yes. I think um, makeup and nail polish is something that's being changed and challenged right now. In terms of the colors, maybe? Perhaps, yeah. Yes. So one can say, for example, that in the past, they had what were perceived of as feminine colors, you know, pink and red, etc. But now they can be black, they can be 
all kinds of other colors that were not in the past as, as, as related to femininity. That's one example. My favorite example has to do with wearing earrings. You know, uh, today, many young men love to wear earrings, and, uh, but they have real problems with their parents or grandparents who may see that as decidedly unmasculine. And, uh, that, and that is one, one example. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all, but maybe in the questions, we can get back to some of these issues. Now, gender ideologies are the ideas, values, beliefs, taboos, et cetera, that we receive and learn at home, at school, on the block, among peers, in religious institutions, and the media about what is acceptable and what is appropriate. And gender ideologies may establish behavioral norms. Behavioral norms, for example, long ago when Men used to open doors for women. That was a behavioral norm. Or walk, put the woman to walk inside and the man to walk outside. Behavioral norms are also the kind of jobs that happened in the home, the sexual division of labor, who did what in the home, whose work was more valued, et cetera, et cetera. And these were established through rewards. So for example, if you did the right thing, you were rewarded, you got a pat on the back, your parents smiled at you. If you did the wrong thing, you, you could get a frown, you could be quarreled with, you could be excluded from the group, you could be banished, you could be stigmatized, all of these for not staying in the boundaries of these behavioral norms. So what are some of the gendered messages you remember getting from one or more of these institutions or an influential individual like a teacher, a parent, et cetera. Perhaps you can answer at the end. Now, gender ideologies, of course, as I mentioned before, are developed through religion, not religion, by a number of all these factors, by parents, by peers, by school, et cetera. And for many young people, peer pressure is one of the most important factors contributing to appropriate masculine behavior, especially and feminine behavior as well, what your friends are doing. Now, the fluid character of the concept of gender allow us to understand situations that I mentioned before, where one's physical body or anatomy, biology, and the behavior that's associated, that should be associated with it does not always fit easily in our Western-oriented societies. It also allows and recognizes the existence of persons who do not fit neatly within the categories of male and female, or whose behaviors challenge the distinctions between masculinity and femininity. For example, persons whose gender identity, as I mentioned, may not coincide with their anatomy. And these, it long ago, used to be described as transsexual persons. Today, they just be called, lumped in the group called trans. And then persons whose anatomical sex, for example, you may be born with what is called uh, ambiguous genitalia. And, uh, usually referred to as intersexed or transgendered long ago. Today, it could be just called trans. And dependent on, later on, dependent on that person, that could be defined as non-binary, but that non-binary is an identity as opposed to a biological or physiological fact. Or persons who may have a sexual preference for the same sex, a preference which differs from that of the majority of persons. So you have homosexual persons referred to in the popular US oriented, Euro American oriented language as gays and lesbians. And all of these groups are usually referred to collectively as queer or LGBTI plus. Actually that list of that, that long growing alphabet was getting so long. So now somebody added a plus plus 
to suggest its infinity. And maybe if we did another course on this, we could go into this more uh, deeply. So while sex gender diversity is often assumed to be something that is modern, sex and gender variations have existed in all societies. Many pre-colonial, pre-modern societies recognize same-sex unions and a third gender or third sex. Today, these people would be defined, referred to as non-binary. That is persons who do not fit into any of the two main sex or gender categories and accept that in between location. Because what has happened in modern societies is that you have two sexes, two genders, and everybody had to fit into these two. But many pre-modern, pre-colonial societies recognized and had groupings for people who did not fit into these groups. So for example, many Caribbean countries, now many of these older practices were outlawed by colonial powers and demonized by conquering religious traditions because many of the pre-modern religious traditions that existed in all our society had greater flexibility around these issues. So many of our Caribbean countries, including our own, still have legacy colonial laws in our books. For example, the buggery laws in Trinidad and Tobago, although these are actively being fought against by LGBTI plus groups. Nepal was the first country to legally recognize non-binary persons in 2007, and Pakistan was the second in 2009. And this is because despite the power of the colonial presence, the, the, the pre-modern non-binary traditions did not disappear. They continue to exist. And although they were criminalized by the colonials, uh, these post-colonial states based on pressure and lobbying are now recognizing these groups. So today, 17 countries in the world have changed their laws to accept third sex gender non-binary categories. And even some of these countries that have accepted these non-binary categories still resist more modern contemporary versions of sex and gender expression. And I think it's important to note that the two of the countries that were the first to legally recognize non-binary persons were countries in the global South not the global north. You know, we tend to always see the north as the progressive places and the south as backward. I think we have to rethink and to recognize our own traditions and to reevaluate some of our own traditions, traditional areas of knowledge and practice. Now, gender variation, very, now, okay, this is just a quotation that defined what I said before. Gender variant people have existed throughout the world and across time. They were celebrated in some cultures, denigrated in others. Some societies recognize people who embody the gender identity beyond the binary. For example, Hijra communities in South Asia, two-spirit people among some Native American cultures, warrior in Southeast Asia, and Fafafin in Pacific Islander communities while the blunt classificatory instruments of colonial rule impose new bureaucracies of gender assignment. These communities persist and continue to provide alternate ways of thinking about gender that evade binary classification. Now, I'm just giving a best practice here because many transgender and intersex persons are hidden and marginalized in many societies. The children are neglected, may never attend school, and as a result, there are few opportunities for normal employment, et cetera. Hence the high numbers who enter the high-risk sex trade. And many trans and intersex persons therefore never receive adequate health care and may die quite early. Now with the support of UN AIDS and the UN Population Fund, Transwave Jamaica, has launched the Trans and Gender Non-Conforming Health National Health Strategy, the first of its kind in the English-speaking tradition. 
And this five-year plan is a right-based roadmap for how the health and well-being of transgender people can be advanced, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that's a best practice that we may look at, particularly in the impact that it has on health and wellness. Now, intersectionality is a very important concept because it brings together the ideas that any single person is affected by a range of factors. So for example, all of us have individual identities as women, men, non-binary, African, Indian, Trinbagonian, a person with a disability, et cetera, et cetera. And our experiences, whether we have privilege or suffer inequality, are the result of the intersection of all of these identities. So for example, it could be your race or ethnicity, your class or economic status, your color, your caste, your sex, your gender identity, nationality, age, sexuality, ability, et cetera. So for example, right now in Trinidad and Tobago, Venezuelan migrants are unable to access the healthcare system. And this is a factor of their, their nationality. And the fact of these conditions of their nationality and how they entered Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, this could affect women and men differently. For example, women who have to deal with pregnancy, et cetera. I hope that they can access the system or it would affect economically their ability to pay for private healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So intersectionality therefore recognizes that one's experience and life situation is the result of the intersection of all these factors so when we look at others, we need, and let's say these people have not done this, these people have not achieved this, these people have no birth certificates, these people are living in a poor house. You need to understand the intersections of factors that have gone on to influence those people's lives. And for example, for that family that had no birth certificates, you could understand how without that, that would then go on to affect everything else in their life, including their access to the health system. And this is a diagram here of intersectionality. So in, this is a US diagram showing privilege and, sorry, can't see the bottom of the diagram, but also domination and privilege. And how all these factors, racism, heterosexism, ableism, ageism, classism, language bias, all of these affect people's experience of privilege. Now we go back to gender and health more specifically. And what we find just as an introduction is that although our health is affected by biological factors, such as genetics, hormonal exposure, et cetera, yet there's a range of social and gendered process that also affect our health differences and outcomes. So researchers have identified a wide range of genetic, hormonal, metabolic influences that affect male and female patterns of morbidity and mortality. For example, we all know that according to WHO estimates, this is a 19, 20, 15, our men have Women have higher life expectancy than men at birth, even though many more men, males are born. Uh, there are also certain sex specific diseases, such as cancer of the cervix and the prostate that affect only women or men. And also we know that many adolescent girls and women die from complications from pregnancy and childbirth. And there's also growing evidence of sex differences in the incidence, symptoms, and prognosis of many other health problems, including HIV, AIDS, tropical infectious diseases, 
tuberculosis, autoimmune problems, and coronary heart diseases. So if health services are to meet the needs of both women and men, then these sex and gender differences that are physiological and anatomical have to be taken seriously in the planning and delivery of care. However, health professionals also have to take into consideration the gender ideologies and that have and health perception that have an impact on health perceptions and health outcomes. For example, there are many gender ideologies supported by religious and other institutions that assume or advocate for male dominance by men, sorry, dominance by men over women. And this has very negative impacts for women and for men. For example, there are notions of appropriate masculinity and femininity that shape women's and men's health-related behavior in many ways. They shape and learn how we experience our bodies. And we all know the significance of certain of our body parts to our identities and to our masculinities and femininities. We know today of how many young women, for example, go through body uh, changes because of certain expectations of what their bodies should look like. We also know of men undergoing penis enlargement, again, based on masculine and feminine gender assumptions of what their bodies should be like. They also determine what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, including in health settings. You know, for example, that many men refuse to have prostate examinations because of the nature of the examination. One man said to me, what, I'm not going for that? They will take January and make February. It also shapes approaches to healthcare and how we are treated by healthcare professionals. Now I just put down there two categories, two, two um, columns here, one for women. For example, we have found that the sexual division of labor means that many women have the majority or the largest component of unwaged care work responsibilities as homemakers, as wives, as mothers. And some sometimes combine this with paid work. It is found that this could be very stressful for women, which could lead to depression and other mental health problems. Then women generally earn lower incomes than men, and they are more likely to become single parents, caregivers than aging spouse, widowed, and to live into their 80s and therefore less able to access paid health care. In fact, the majority of people living alone are old elderly women. There's also gender inequality where men are presumed to have power over women. And this justifies gender-based violence against women and girls, which is a major health problem worldwide. Uh, 2018 study in Trinidad and Tobago found that 30% of ever partnered women experience lifetime physical and or sexual partner violence. And 6% experienced this in the 12 months prior to data collection. Also in the Caribbean, sexual abuse of girls and a minority of boys is prevalent and based on masculine notions of sexual entitlement. Now in relation to men, traditional masculine behaviors contribute to men's lower and inferior longevity and some types of pathology more frequently that are more frequent in men than women. In some countries like Japan, the male breadwinner ideal contributes to work stress and hostility and eventually male mortality as work stress can increase the risk of hypertension, heart attack, and stroke. Now risk taking, and this is a big one because injuries and accidents is a major cause of male deaths in Trinidad and Tobago and globally. So risk taking leads to physically dangerous exercises, activities, for example, high speed driving, alcohol and substance use, extreme sports, and the inability to refuse 
risk challenges. For example, when somebody says, I bet you can't do this, or why you don't want to jump off the wall, because you're afraid, or those kinds of risk challenges, encourage men to take risks that can be debilitating and dangerous. In addition, illness can be perceived as weakness, therefore less health-seeking behavior, including professional help, uh, is, is a big challenge. And instead, alcoholic consumption, substance use, or violence may substitute. And this is a, an extract from a survey of gender and health-seeking behaviors among males in Trinidad and Tobago. And it said that men would seek immediate help if there was blood in the feces, if they had palpitations, or if they experienced impotence. Help was sought after a few weeks if they had experienced a persistent cough or back pains. They would seek help only if told by a significant other to do so for excessive drinking or violent behavior. Although a greater number said they would never seek help for these issues. Similarly, while 20% of men would seek help if they were feeling down, 28.5% reported they would never seek help for feeling down. In addition, all the young men aged 20 and under thought it acceptable for men to take responsibility for their own health compared to 82% of those aged 47 to 66. So this looks positive for the future. Now, gender violence and health. Violence is prevalent in the lives of Caribbean people and is a leading cause of death and dismemberment. Caribbean countries have some of the highest homicide rates in the world. So violence, therefore, is a critical health issue as well as a critical gender issue. So the forms of violence include gender-based violence against women and girls, criminal violence, police violence, and gang violence, all contributing to high injury and homicide rates. Now, violence is also a gender issue, as I mentioned, as it is identified with a strong and powerful masculinity and conveys a sense of power on those who exercise it. And I must add that having a firearm adds to that feeling of power and of a powerful masculinity. In fact, some people have referred to firearms as a lyrical gun, you know, as, a, as, a, as a symbolic gun, because that firearm really makes a man feel more like a man, which is actually very scary to me. Trinidad and Tobago, around 2014, was among the seven countries in Latin America and the Caribbean where homicide was a leading cause of death for boys 10 to 19 years of old, and where advances in child survival are offset by homicide deaths. So I just wanted to stress the link between gender and violence, and also the way in which violence then becomes an important health challenge. So to summarize, I would say that gender is a fundamental concept which shapes every aspect of our lives, even if we are unaware of it. And I'm hoping that after this session, you'll be more aware. And this would include the recognition of gender differences in anatomy and certain specific aspects of physiology, disease, and pathology, but also the recognition of the impact of socially constructed gender ideologies and norms that affect women and men's health related behaviors and capacity to realize their health potential. So when a patient comes before you, you have to remember that this patient is shaped by all those intersecting characteristics, including their gender. So intersectional inequalities in access to health resources for example, sex or gender, poverty, inequality, race, ethnicity, class, color, lack of education, et cetera, all have damaging effects on women's well being and that of their children. Men face particular problems because of the link between masculine identities and ideologies 
and expectations and entitled feelings of entitlement to power, control, and risk taking. Caribbean medical practice and health systems must be changed to enhance services to sex and gender diverse children and adults, gender and other intersectional hierarchies among medical professionals. And I didn't go into this because I was, I was sensitive to the time, but I just want to highlight it, that gender and other intersectional hierarchies among medical professionals must also be reduced and replaced with new forms of patient engagement and recognition of the value of all health professionals. Gender sensitivity to sex and gender, sorry, gender sensitivity is needed in medical research, service delivery, and wider social policies. And gender analysis must be incorporated into Caribbean medical education, including in the Faculty of Medical Sciences, beginning with at least one course on gender and health. That is my suggestion. And I hope after this, you would be excited to begin to think of the possibilities of how this could be integrated into everything you read, everything you listen to, and eventually into your practice. So our approach to medicine and health must be intersectional and gender aware. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Prof, for your very much enlightening and informative lecture on the gender issues on our medical practice. And now I would like to welcome comments and questions from the audience here. We have about 440 participant. So I would like to invite questions and comments from our participant. So there is a question one here by KS. To anyone who is currently a healthcare provider, what is the view or situation like with regards to gender and sexuality? when it comes to patient as well as colleagues. What is the view? Yeah. Oh, they are, uh, well, the view is that they're patients. We don't really, uh, what, what, okay, so you're given the basic principles of care and you customize that care to the particular social situation of and medical situation of the patient. Um, but I can't give anything more definitive than that. Uh, the principles of ethics were outlined by uh, Dr. Espiny and amplified by, um, by Sir George. So uh, those are the principles that apply and then you customize it to the case of the patient. But um, if I, for instance, get a patient with asthma, there are a few gender differences in asthma, but, and I'm a pulmonologist by the way, um, but Obesity and other factors are far more important when it comes to differences between the severity of asthma uh, in one patient compared to another. So um, I'm afraid I can't, uh, without a specific example, I, I can't give you a, a, a better answer than that. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues here wish to comment uh, who are practitioners. Okay, so we don't want to prolong this, but that's as far yeah. as we can go. And uh, if we get more specific questions, we can answer. But uh, really, I would like the questions uh, addressed to our, 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 our world-famous speaker um, rather than to practitioners. Thanks. Yeah. So, good day. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, good day, Professor Adolf. Um, I found your link to colonialism and our current gender norms and the way we view gender in the Caribbean to be incredibly fascinating. I was just wondering if you possibly had any recommended resources or reading to further my knowledge on that particular topic. Yes, I, I actually wrote an article where I looked at this in the Global South, including Africa, Asia, another part. And there are lots of, I can give you some references if you, if you know, if you send me your email address, sure, I'll give you some references to that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your 
inquisitiveness to know more about the gender issues and i hope our prof will inform you on that issue share the link or share the material with you uh any other question please yeah there is one question in the chat uh professor but it's not really for prof redock it's uh, mm -hmm. upon completing the mbbs and looking to pursue postgraduate studies locally Am I required to fly out to other countries to complete my exams in all cases to specialize, or is that only for specific fields? Uh, you've got it right to the, to the person asking the question. You've got it right at the last sentence. Yeah, it's for specific fields. Uh, as I said when I was introducing Prof. Uh, Sir George Allen, um, the DM, which is the Doctorate in Medicine, which is the specialty uh, degree for, 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 for several medical subspecialties, um, are offered here in Trinidad. We have um, 17 such postgraduate programs and there are 23 in all offered by the faculty on all the campuses. It doesn't rep represent all of the subspecialties, but most are covered here. Um, if you want one that's not covered here, of course, then yes, you will have to travel away. But, but some people prefer to travel elsewhere in order to enlarge their experience and, and that is a good thing as well. Dermatology is covered in Jamaica, not here in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, okay. thank, thank you so much, Prof, uh, for uh, carefully answering all those queries from our audience. And also now I would like to express my special thanks to Prof Redock, despite his busy schedule, for coming to this virtual platform and making the time for this purpose to enlighten our students about a very sensitive issue. And it is not about only medicine. It is more than what we call particularly social medicine and humanities in medicine. And that is the whole purpose of this orientation week. And throughout the orientation week, there will be so many other related lectures to enlighten you and to inform you how you can sell through this through your five year stay in the medical school. And with that, I would like to express my special thanks, heartfelt thanks to Prof. Redock on behalf of the Dean, on behalf of the faculty, and hope she will continue to support at different points of time with this type of activities. And- Thank you very much. It was a great privilege. Yeah, thank you, Prof. And with that, now we would like to adjourn these today's activities for orientation week day one. Today it is complete and you are required to join tomorrow as per the program that you have that have been shared with you and join on time so that you will not miss anything that is very, very critical for your stay during this medical, during the period of stay in the medical school, whether it is pharmacy program or whether it is dentistry, veterinary, optometry, or MBBS or nursing. With that, we end the sessions and thank you so much, everyone. And I would like our Gerald to end the session to the public. Okay, thank you.